When things in the Marvel Universe get far too convoluted, there's only one thing to do, a good old universe reset. And that's exactly what writers Scott Lobdell, Mark Wade, and Andy Kubert did with the super epic and legendary Onslaught saga. It introduced a heinous new evil force, a being so unholy that its very existence is a sin. Onslaught is the sum total, the combination the merger of the darkest parts of Professor X and Magneto's psyche. He's the reflection and manifestation of their most evil nature and persona. In this marvelous video, we'll explore the iconic comic book saga and dive deeper into its effects on the Marvel Universe. Let's uh, begin, shall we? The seeds for Onslaught's eventual appearance were popping up everywhere in Marvel Comics in the early 90s. In one of the team's more recent exploits during the storyline Fatal Attractions, Magneto strips Wolverine of all the adamantium embedded in his skeleton. This gruesome act renders Logan to a feral, beast-like creature and angers Xavier to the point where he's forced to rid Magneto of all his mental faculties and memories. However, this shutdown of Magneto's brain becomes the genesis for Onslaught as something dark begins to brew inside the kind professor. Meanwhile, anti-mutant hysteria has grown to new extremes and has begun to spill into our heroes' everyday lives. There's turbulence in other corners of the Marvel Universe, too. A young Franklin Richards, Sue and Reed's son, is a mutant with powers that can warp the very fabric of reality itself. Recently, the child has befriended a seemingly gentle apparition, Charlie, whom the child keeps secret from his parents. The first move. We get our first real introduction to the malicious manifestation of psionic energy in X-Men issue number 53. The story begins on a mundane Saturday, with Jean Grey in Salem Center, trying to shop in peace. However, out of nowhere, she suddenly snuck off to an astral plane, only to be greeted by a towering figure somewhat resembling Magneto. He proclaims himself a sympathizer to the mutant race and prophesizes that after decades of discrimination, a flashpoint in human mutation relations has finally arrived. Moreover, he states that he's there to prepare Jean for the particularly special part she has to play in it. Despite Jean's attempts to convince him of coexistence and harmony between humans and mutants, the mysterious villain almost laughs at her naivety, transporting their astral forms to the shop where Jean had been shopping. We hear all the vile thoughts in people's heads, experiencing firsthand the discrimination and ridicule all mutants go through. The shopkeeper mutters, Good riddance, you exaggerate. Upon discovering that Jean has disappeared from the dressing room, we see the masked face distort into an angry glare, and an energy blast annihilates the shopping complex as Jean watches. But it's a mere illusion. Wish fulfillment, as he puts it. Jean and this strange companion fly off as he promises to reveal more of humanity's dark secrets. In New Jersey, Hank McCoy is being held prisoner inside an abandoned factory, left to his own devices and with a meager device left there to dispense water. Despite Hank's best attempts to conserve the liquid, the dispenser falls and water spills onto the floor. But this mistake reveals a slight ray of hope for Hank in the form of a hidden trap door. Gene and the mysterious entity are now in Manhattan at an anti-mutant presidential campaign headed by Graydon Creed. Gene argues that despite the hatred in Creed and his followers, they weren't hypocrites. Instead, their disdain for mutants was quite open. Unfazed, the figure asks Gene to look closely at Creed's minions especially his campaign manager, Steve. It's there that the hypocrisy lies in the people who continue to hunt and demonize mutants just for personal gain. There are no feelings or philosophy in their discrimination. People like Steve just persecute mutants because that's what their dayminder told them to do. Trying to defend herself, Jean provokes the entity even more by stating that at least the people she trusts, her friends, would never fall into such duplicity. But her abductor seems to have an answer, even for that. Psylocke and Archangel are in their remote cabin in Colorado. For the past nine hours, Betsy has been screaming in excruciating pain while Warren, the winged mutant, keeps her company. He states that it's the shadows that have been killing her. We turn to a wall and see that the shadows are beginning to take a familiar form. Betsy screams at Warren to back off, just as the hulking juggernaut breaks into their cliffside home. But he isn't there to attack the couple. Instead, the juggernaut seems to be holding a terrible secret powerful enough to save the world. But Betsy soon realizes that a telepathic mental block keeps the Juggernaut from revealing his knowledge to others. Despite all her prowess, Betsy can't probe into the Juggernaut's head. In his struggle, the Juggernaut accidentally falls off the cliff, but isn't bothered by the fall. Instead, in his desperation to let the X-Men know of the secret he can't reveal, the Juggernaut begins his journey toward Westchester to meet a certain professor. Traveling through the astral plane, we find Jean and the strange man inside the Xavier's Institute where we find an unassuming professor sitting alone. They enter Xavier's mind, and we see glimpses of Jean and the professor's past. Jean is confident that Professor X, the father figure who took her in so many years ago, one of the world's strongest yet kindest mutants, had no secrets. However, she's soon proven wrong as we travel to her memory before their first mission. In the memory, 
Jean tells a concerned professor not to worry. However, in his thoughts, the professor responds with something that calls Jean to question her entire relationship with this revered father figure. How could he stop worrying about the one he loved? As Xavier's terrible feelings are revealed, a shocked Jean tumbles down into the darkest depths of the professor's mind, where he's locked away every single negative emotion he ever felt. No, the true Xavier. The masked figure instructs her, as Jean is slowly consumed by all the negative thoughts Xavier has ever had. As this happens, we also glimpse a lost and disoriented Magneto, who somehow found his way to South Carolina. He finds his way to a small fair and introduces himself as Joseph under the watchful eyes of the onlookers. In the astral plane, Jean slowly gains footing and starts attacking the hooded figure. However, in a show of unprecedented power, the figure snatches the bird out of the sky, definitively defeating one of the most powerful mutants on the planet. Jean's unconscious body is discovered in the same shopping mall where we'd first seen her at the beginning of the issue. As she slowly gains her senses, she struggles to make sense of what seems now to be just a terrible dream. But the figure's last words linger in her psyche, know my name. Then, as she passes a mirror, she realizes what he meant. The name, which is now scrawled all across her face, reads Onslaught. Before we move on, if you like it up until now, please do hit the like and subscribe buttons. It may be a small thing for you, but to us, it means an awful lot. Well, with that out of the way, huh, let's continue. The Professor's Flaws The following clues to Onslaught's identity appear in issue number 334. The Juggernaut's massive body emerges from the depths of a lake near the X-Mansion. What is it about him that's got me spooked? The Crimson Giant mutters to himself while plunging deeper into the cold waters. Here, he discovers a security camera which he promptly destroys. Sadly, beating the Onslaught wouldn't be as easy, he realizes. After all, the Juggernauts barely survived their last encounter. Maybe there was one way. But that unspoken secret lay deep in the recesses of the Juggernaut's mind. A little distance away, inside the walls of the mansion built by the Juggernaut's stepbrother, Professor Charles Xavier, Bishop is trying to fix the malfunctioning Cerebro. The time-traveling mutant seems to be having a hard time comprehending how the technology inside the machine could be so similar to the one in his time. What could have stunted technological development to such a degree? This contemplation is interrupted by Gambit, and the two strike up a conversation. But suddenly, the intruder alarm set off by the Juggernaut flares up. In another section of the mansion, inside the Danger Room, Cyclops is training by himself when a disturbed Jean appears. Rattled by her encounter with Onslaught, she tries to remember details, but her memory is fading away second by second. However, she refuses Cyclops when he suggests that they consult the Professor across the country. Archangel and Psylocke realize that their communication with the Professor has been severed and start towards Westchester. Inside the Professor's study, the youngest X-Man, Sam Guthrie, also known as Cannonball, tries to confront his feelings of inadequacy in front of the Professor. However, the Professor uncharacteristically snaps at the young mutant, calling his feelings inconsequential in the face of all the daily threats they face. Cannonball leaves the Professor alone, assuring him they'll never have this conversation again. At the lake, Gambit and Bishop are trying to figure out the source of the security alarm when they're suddenly ambushed by the Juggernaut. The unsuspecting duo is easily defeated by the Juggernaut, who laments that this caliber of X-Men wouldn't be enough to stop Onslaught before carrying away his unconscious opponents. In another corner of the massive mansion, a recovering Wolverine had been placed in the care of the Beast's imposter. This is another version of Hank from the Age of Apocalypse, lacking the real Beast's intellect. The imposter is easily baffled by the real beast's various duties. Finding an opportune moment, he lets Wolverine loose. Storm tries to chase after the berserker, but is stopped by a very concerned cannonball, who needs to talk to her about the professor. Still reeling from her encounter with Onslaught, discovers the unconscious bodies of Bishop and Gambit in the lake house. Suddenly, the Juggernaut shows himself to Jean, proclaiming that he's there to help. Jean stands unconvinced until he utters the dreaded word, Onslaught, which sparks her interest. To definitively seal their association, Kane Marco removes his helmet, the only thing that protects him from a telepath's powers right in front of Jean. Meanwhile, in the depths of Professor X's war room, Cyclops has a strange encounter with his mentor, sporting an unfamiliar grin. The professor belittles his favorite student before disappearing into thin air. In the final pages of the issue, Jean Grey leads Juggernaut deeper into the reaches of the X-Men's lair. Just above the darkened tunnels of Morlock, they find a psi-shielded chamber. Beyond it lies the answer to the question, who is Onslaught? Onslaught strikes. A solemn cannonball sits outside the X-Mansion, disappointed by his interaction with the professor. Cyclops tries to comfort the young X-Man, but they're suddenly interrupted by Gambit, Beast, Bishop, Iceman, and Storm. Juggernaut's sighting stirs the mansion into action. Suspecting him to be a threat to the Professor, the X-Men take off in search of Marco. However, unknown to them all, Jean and the Juggernaut have traveled far into the mansion. The unlikely companions probe deeper, trying to uncover the secret locked away inside the Juggernaut's mind by the Onslaught. Inside the Psy-Shielded Chamber, 
Jean tries to penetrate Kane Marco's mind, but the moment she seals the chamber, her connection with Scott Summers is severed. Even amid his hunt for Juggernaut, Cyclops notices the sudden disappearance of his wife and takes off toward the mansion, leaving Storm and Cannonball to continue the search. The others hardly find any clues either, but the Iceman begins to suspect something is wrong with the beast. Fortunately, many miles away from the mansion, the real Hank McCoy finally finds the way out of his prison. But just as he finds his way to the exteriors of the factory where he was being incarcerated, Hank is suddenly stopped by two shadowy figures. An extremely tense Cyclops tries to bring Jean's disappearance to Professor X's notice. The Professor, however, remains uncharacteristically calm about the ordeal. Only when Scott mentions Onslaught can he draw a reaction from the Professor. Moreover, Scott notices that the Professor is also beginning to take a sudden interest in the Fantastic Four, which is evident from the files on his computer. When Cyclops informs the Professor that his stepbrother has broken into the school grounds, a stoic professor commands that the mansion's defenses be deactivated so the Juggernaut can be lured in. Inside the psionic chamber, after the prolonged efforts of Jean and Juggernaut, cracks are finally beginning to appear in the mental block placed by Onslaught on Marco. But for the moment, the professor remains oblivious to their struggles. Deep in thought, the X-Men's founder is lost in the memories of his biggest failures. A sense of frustration creeps up on him. Despite his life's efforts, mutant human relations seem to be crumbling. On the TV in front of him, his worst fears are coming true. The police are dragging away members of a mob after the brutal lynching of a teenage mutant. From the magazines on his desk, Creed's face taunts him with his anti-mutant propaganda. Things get too much to bear, and the professor snaps. In this vulnerable state, something seems to consume him. Inside the shielded chamber, Jean starts with a sudden scream. Onslaught, I know who he is. With manic urgency, she urges the Juggernaut to escape, stating that Onslaught is now within the mansion's confines. However, as the Juggernaut tries to escape, he finds himself lost. The mansion transforms into a strange labyrinth, passages and stairways blending into each other until he finally emerges into the Professor's office. The place is upturned, and the Professor's chair lies unattended. Suddenly, a massive hand emerges from the darkness and grabs the Juggernaut. It's Onslaught. He taunts Marco for a moment before ripping the gem of Sitarak from his chest, reducing him into a normal human being. The figure towers over a fallen Marco and sneers, declaring that he's been waiting for this moment all his life. It's then that we realize that Onslaught is none other than Professor Charles Xavier. He establishes a connection with his trusted X-Men and asks them to come to him, or rather, to Onslaught. At the same moment, Nate Gray appears in front of the Avengers in another corner of the world bearing dreadful news. Professor Charles Xavier, leader of the X-Men, has gone insane. The Fall of the X-Men. Jean sends out a distress signal to fellow X-Men outside the mansion, informing them of heavy damage incurred by the residents of the mansion. We learn that both the blue and red teams have been decimated, and Jean herself has been stripped of her power. The perpetrator is none other than their revered mentor, Professor Xavier. As she's trying to make a case for onslaught resulting from the psionic damage that Professor Xavier's psyche had taken, while shutting down Magneto's mind, he finds her. A massive blast lights up her face, and then she's gone. This is the prologue to the first issue of Onslaught X-Men. We travel back to some 45 minutes before the prologue, where the prof has summoned all the X-Men to his office. Scott Summers immediately notices that there's something up with his wife, Jean Grey. After all, she's the only one amongst the X-Men who knows Onslaught's true identity. But for the moment, she's forced to keep it to herself in order to fool the man in the wheelchair. All she can do is ask Cyclops to trust her. The professor states to the crowd of X-Men that he made a mistake. The mistake was his steadfast belief that humanity could be pulled out of the darkness of ignorance and look beyond their genetic insecurities, that they'd allow mutants to live with pride and dignity. Instead, the world had turned into a tragic mess, all while the X-Men stayed in the comfort of their mansion. Outside, mobs were hunting mutants down, passing laws to incarcerate them, and the conflict was just growing every day. All that had to change. It was time for the mutants to take control and resolve their problems. It becomes clear from these words that this was not the professor the X-Men were familiar with. While the others stand perplexed by this change in their mentor, Jean tries to probe into his mind. She tries to do it carefully while remaining undetected. However, she quickly realizes that the Professor has already played her for a fool. A glance at the Professor's desk reveals to Jean the gem Sitarak, pried away from the Juggernaut's chest, which means that he's been defeated. Jean's secret was already known by the Professor. Her efforts in the end were too little and too late. Xavier blocks Jean's telepathic connection with the rest of the mutants while an adulterated psionic energy spills into the room. Slowly, it begins to take the form of the dreaded Onslaught. With a single word, Onslaught silences Jean with a psionic muzzle. As the other X-Men try to figure out what's wrong with Jean, Cannonball suddenly notices what's become of their dear professor. Their mentor is completely gone, 
and in his place stands the manifestation of all the negative feelings Professor X has ever felt. All the Professor's most suppressed emotions stand unleashed, now taking the hulking form standing before them. Onslaught tries to persuade the X-Men to follow him in his goal to set the world right by stripping humans of their free will. Words more suited to Magneto than to the kind Professor, as Cyclops notices. Then, in a blatant display of his abilities, Onslaught begins to toy with his students. With a single thought, he renders Wolverine into a cowering cub, forces Iceman to rearrange his body on a molecular level and plunges Storm into a tragic childhood memory. Then, the unexpected happens. The professor's favorite pupil shoots his teacher down with a powerful optic blast. This gives the other X-Men time to regroup and stand behind their leader. Onslaught, however, is far too powerful. He places all the X-Men under a telepathic attack, making them immobile before disappearing. In a last-ditch attempt to escape Onslaught's psionic grip, Gambit charges the floorboards, allowing the team to escape. However, Jean declares that the trick shouldn't have worked, and the fact that it did meant that Onslaught wasn't entirely in control of Xavier's faculties yet. Jean realizes that her last encounter with Onslaught was essentially a warning from a dormant Xavier buried somewhere deep within the monster. But in order to save Xavier, the X-Men would first have to beat Onslaught. Since the X-Men had denied his offer to join them, the villain would now have to recruit power from somewhere else. Cyclops guides the X-Men into battle to stop this, and the members ready themselves to face the man who once trained them to fight. While the X-Men scutter across the mansion, the Fantastic Four are having a regular family breakfast. However, Sue feels something ominous in the air, unknown to any of them. Sue and Reed's son, Franklin, has made a new friend. Charlie is an apparition created by Onslaught to befriend the mutant child. However, Franklin is far too innocent to comprehend his nefarious plans. In a bout of anger, Charlie accidentally sends a glass flying with a psionic burst of energy. He immediately regrets it, though. After all, he'd have to control his temper much better to gain access to Franklin and his immense power. The X-Men are purging the mansion's system of all the files on different mutants that Onslaught could use when they come across Franklin's records. They also find Nate Gray, a man entirely a mystery to them, apart from the knowledge that he's powerful enough to manipulate the astral plane into the corporeal world, a power very similar to Onslaught. Just as the team is registering this new information, Cannonball begins to behave strangely. Then, out of nowhere, he begins to blast through the other members until Bishop is forced to shoot him down. Onslaught, who had taken control of the poor boy, finally shows himself. In an instant, he overpowers the X-Men, filling their minds with a thousand silent screams, his endless wrath let loose upon our heroes. In Manhattan, Nate Gray, the X-Man, is trying to convince the Avengers of this new world-ending threat. The Earth's mightiest heroes doubt his claims until he starts bleeding from the inside. A wide-eyed Thor finally awakens to the truth in Nate's claims. But several of the X-Men have already fallen. Storm, Gambit, Cannonball, and Wolverine lie unconscious amongst the wreckage. Onslaught hovers overhead. Bishop held tight in his grasp. While sending Bishop crashing to the ground, he proclaims that he'd wanted to study Bishop's memories of the Age of Apocalypse to understand what had brought about En Sabarner's reign. The remainder of the X-Men, Jean, Cyclops, Iceman, and the imposter Dark Beast are trying to wipe data off Cerebro when Bobby suddenly seems to fire at nothing. However, it turns out to be Onslaught under a psionic shield that Bobby could detect by reading his body temperature. But this doesn't stop Onslaught, who compels the X-Men to attack each other, thus defeating them. The only remaining is the False Beast, who unsurprisingly offers to join Onslaught. But suddenly, Onslaught's step seems to falter, resulting from his host Xavier resisting him. After the battle, Onslaught and Beast take Jean into another corner of the mansion. Here, he torments Jean to make her reveal the secrets of the Phoenix. Jean resists, but is considerably wounded. However, finding an opportune moment, she manages to find her way out of the room and into the psi shielded chamber. It's here that we first see Jean in the prologue of the story. Onslaught finds Jean and corners her, but she adamantly stands her ground. Just as it feels like the end is nigh for Jean, a beam of crimson energy comes through the ceiling and shoots Onslaught down. It's Cyclops and the rest of Jean's team, somehow arriving just in the nick of time. The battle reaches its climax as the X-Men battle it out with Onslaught. The combined might of their power slows the psionic monster down and finally knocks it over. As their efforts begin to show results, Bishop contemplates their failure to save Charles Xavier from himself. As Onslaught's body stops moving, the X-Men are forced to come to terms with the fact that they might have just killed their founder. Just as things seem to calm down, Bishop notices something behind them. Onslaught fires one last time with a massive psionic blast powerful enough to stop a thousand mutants. In a moment of pure determination and selflessness, Bishop somehow manages to absorb the blast and shield the others before passing out. The real Onslaught, however, manages to escape along with his new lackey, Beast. The X-Men gather themselves and tend to their wounds. Though brutal, the encounter helps them gather clues especially regarding Onslaught's strange connection to Magneto. Somehow, the heroes have survived this battle, but the war against Onslaught rages on. In another corner of America, something else is brewing. A new line of Sentinel stands, with a menacing glare in their eyes, ready to take on all mutant kind.
Apocalypse lives. In a dark cavern, the Stone King Ozymandias dutifully awaits the awakening of his master. At long last, the ancient mutant rises, and we know that Apocalypse lives. Rising toward the heavens, he responds to Xavier's fall from grace and estimates that the Age of Wonders is nearing its end. Further evidence of this is provided by Uatu the Watcher, who Apocalypse claims is there to watch the end of the era. Members of the Avengers finally make their way to Westchester County, only to find the Xavier's Institute reduced to ruins. Nate assures the Avengers that he can still sense all the X-Men apart from the Professor in the structure, and the Quinjet quickly descends on the crumbling mansion. But just before touching down, it's pulled by an invisible force and crashes. Quicksilver dashes out of the aircraft toward an assailant in the distance, only to find Gambit in the rubble. Seeing Quicksilver in the intended position, a hidden bishop points a gun to his head, point blank. The earth begins to shake as a scarlet light grows from underneath. It explodes, knocking Bishop over. It's the Avengers descending from their crashed Quinjet. In response to the Scarlet Witch's attack, the sky grows darker and a bolt of lightning strikes the Avengers carrier. The X-Men gather, standing directly in confrontation against the Earth's mightiest heroes. Nate Grey watches the futile skirmish from inside the Quinjet, growing more frustrated by the second. In a strange feat of telepathic ability, he reaches out to all the X-Men and pulls memories of Onslaught from their mind. The X-Man then projects this image out into the world, and the Avengers finally catch a glimpse of this new threat in all its glory. Suddenly, Cyclops knocks Nate over with a slight optic blast and confirms that Charles Xavier has turned into Onslaught. As the actual severity of the situation finally sinks in, the heroes eventually band together. The most troubled, however, are Wanda and Pietro, because Onslaught indeed bears a strong resemblance to their nefarious father, Magneto. On the island of Muir, members of the mutant team Excalibur gather in an emergency meeting. Colossus, Kitty Pride, Nightcrawler and Moira McTaggart seem to be relieved that all the X-Men made it out alive. There's discussion as to why they're not leaving to help the others when Moira reveals that the clue to defeating Onslaught is on the island itself. The mysterious Xavier Protocols would finally have to be unsealed. Despite their losses, the X-Men are finally starting to regroup. In a meeting, both the X-Men and the Avengers come to an inevitable conclusion. Onslaught, this terrifying creature of pure psionic energy, had indeed been born when Professor X wiped Magneto's mind. Their personas had somehow merged into a sentient entity, a twisted amalgamation of all their frustrations. Soon, members of the X-Force, Sunspot, Domino and Siren also appear to help their former teammates. Somewhere in the exteriors of the mansion, Wolverine is also readying himself for a long journey, all in the hopes of finding that one clue that could defeat Onslaught. By the end of the issue, the X-Men seem to have recuperated. However, under the sewers of Manhattan, Onslaught and his servant, the Dark Beast, quietly plan the next villainous step in their bid to take over the world. Deep within Onslaught, a weary and battered Professor X tries against all hope to save the remnants of himself from the being that has taken over. A new Magneto. Our heroes deduce that there's an evident link between Magneto and Onslaught. Thus, the Avengers depart to seek answers from the Master of Magnetism. One addition to the team of heroes is the mutant Gambit, who finds himself a little out of place amongst these new allies. Captain America guides the rest of the Avengers into battle as they board Iron Man's new Quinjet, but it's clear that Wanda has something bearing heavy on her mind. The rest of the crew stay back at the Avengers' mansion, where Giant Man is trying to comb the Earth with the help of Cerebro. He's finally able to point to a location somewhere in South Carolina, which had recently emerged as a hub for electromagnetic activity. As the Quinjet flies in Magneto's direction, Wanda finds herself reminiscing on a complicated past with her father and the endless abuse she suffered at his hands. Fortunately, the rest of the Avengers and her brother Quicksilver managed to pull her out of this internal crisis. In Norfolk, Virginia, we find Magneto, stripped of all his memories and donning a new identity, Joseph. He's also been significantly de-aged, which makes him all the more difficult to be recognized. Though he still retains some control over his powers, they're nowhere as strong as they used to be. While doing odd jobs around the town, he encounters a familiar face, the former X-Man, Rogue. The two headed off and are engrossed in conversation when a sudden gust of wind knocks them off their feet. The Quinjet descends, and Quicksilver rushes out to punch his father squarely in the jaw. Tempers flare as Pietro attacks a clueless Magneto again and again, much to the horror of his teammates. Tempers flare even further when Vision accuses Rogue of being in league with Magneto, which leads her to attack the android and carry him into the air. Iron Man tries to apprehend Magneto, but the team realizes to their horror that he still has his powers. Magneto displays his immense strength by sending the armored Avenger flying. He then proceeds to take control of the metal in the Captain's shield and Quicksilver, incapacitating them. Only the Scarlet Witch remains but finds herself unable to attack the man in front of her due to the unspeakable trauma she suffered at his hands. As she falls to the ground, Magneto, or rather Joseph, comes to her aid. It's clear from that one action that this is not the same Magneto as before. As the realization sinks, Wanda reconsiders her animosity and stops a lethal attack from Quicksilver, 
saving the reformed Magneto. The noticeable change in Magneto causes both parties to calm down. The Avengers still invite Magneto to join them as his involvement could be a definitive factor in the fight against Onslaught. As the team returns to the aircraft after a successful mission, only one thing remains clear. Onslaught could only be stopped together. The Fantastic Four face the Onslaught. Onslaught next appears in the pages of the Fantastic Four, where a young Franklin Richards is still coping with the arrival of his new friend, Charlie. But Charlie is essentially a creation of Onslaught, designed to lead the powerful mutant child to his side. At the beginning of the book, Charlie helps Franklin hone his telepathic abilities by allowing him to probe into the professor's memories. Charlie, however, is forced to disappear when Franklin's parents return from their mission. The Fantastic Four gather in their lab, and Franklin rushes into Sue's arms. The four are also accompanied by Reed's father, Nathaniel Richards, and Johnny's ex-wife, Scroll Lyja. But not everything is as happy as it seems. Suddenly, Reed is informed of the arrival of a peculiar guest. Professor Rex awaits the superhero family in the lobby. Simultaneously, they also receive an emergency transmission from the Avengers, making it a curious turn of events. Lang answers the transmission from the Avengers mansion and is greeted by Black Widow, who's trying to warn him of the malicious entity corrupting Xavier. But Professor Rex knocks the hero out before he can alert the rest of his team, half a continent away. Black Widow realizes that there's something wrong and readies her team consisting of Bishop, Hawkeye, Iceman, Wasp, Crystal, and Giant Man. Professor X tries to trick the Richards into handing him Franklin's custody. He argues that as a mutant, Franklin would have a better chance at honing and controlling his powers at the Institute than his fellow mutants. The Franklin's family denies the offer, and something evil stirs inside the Professor again. Meanwhile, Lyja and the Human Torch are trying to have a private conversation when they're interrupted by a team of Avengers and X-Men. Bishop, Iceman, Crystal, and Hawkeye teleport into the tower with the help of Lockjaw in the nick of time, just as the Professor manifests his evil form. The four fall back and try to mount their defense. Fortunately, they run into Johnny and the other visitors who help them to comprehend the situation. The heroes split up into five teams to try and locate Onslaught. We see Johnny use his flames to pinpoint Onslaught's location, but find himself overpowered by Xavier's alter ego. Onslaught then defeats Crystal and Nathaniel, taking down the first team sent by our heroes. In another corner of the heroes' quarters, the Thing, Hawkeye, and Lyja also find themselves facing the villain. Their physical attacks have no effect, and they too are easily incapacitated. The next in line are Sue and Bishop who find Onslaught hiding in Franklin's room. In an ingenious display of strategy, Bishop stores energy from the Invisible Woman's attacks and fires it at Onslaught. For once, the villain falters and begins to change form under the immense power of Bishop's plasma blasts. We see him turn back into the Professor, but it's just a trick to lure Bishop, who makes the fatal mistake of trusting his opponent. While the battle rages, Franklin Richard sits in a corner enjoying cookies. Suddenly, his friend and Onslaught's illusion, Charlie, finds the young boy. However, before he can be whisked away, Reed Richards and Iceman find their way to the room, and another tough battle begins. Eventually, the defeated heroes also gain their sense and find their way to Franklin, but a powerful psionic blast knocks them all out. Our protagonists lie defeated as Onslaught carries away Franklin with relative ease. Cable angers the Hulk. A desperate Cable hurries to dismantle his bike and redeem the weapon stored inside it. Only a few crucial seconds remain before he descends upon Cable. Just as predicted, only moments later, Cable is greeted by a terrifying sight. The Green Goliath, Hulk himself, is lunging at our time traveler. However, the Hulk assures Cable that he's there to help him and urges him to put the gun down. But Cable realizes that he's unable to read Hulk's mind, which usually just means something bad. His suspicions are confirmed when the Hulk finds his moment and kicks Cable high into the air, muttering three dreaded words. Onslaught sends his regards. An earth-shattering battle plays out between the two. An earth-shattering battle plays out between the two, and Cable finds himself at a disadvantage as his psi energy is split between fighting the Hulk and defending himself from the Technovirus. With great effort, Cable manages to knock the Hulk down, only to find an even more disturbing fact. The Hulk recovers and turns grey. We know that we're now watching a third personality hidden away in Banner's tortured psyche. This new Hulk begins to land such a brutal beating upon Nathan Summers that the citizens in the vicinity have to be evacuated. S.H.I.E.L.D. Commander G.W. Bridge and Officer Contessa Valentina de Fontaine watch the intense conflict unfold from the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier above Manhattan and are forced to change their course towards Baltimore. The battle isn't going well for Cable. The Technovirus is at the cusp of consuming him while the Hulk smashes an entire diner over his head. The only respite comes when Storm makes it to the scene and drives the Hulk away momentarily. She then lifts the diner off of Cable's unconscious body, only to find that his heart is stopped. In a desperate move, Storm drives a bolt of lightning into Cable's body, resuscitating him. The Hulk returns just as they find their feet again, but Cable stops it with a powerful psionic blast this time. Though the Hulk turns green again, 
It's clear from a single look into his green eyes that the rage monster is now angrier than ever, somewhere far away. Apocalypse and Ozymandias watch with bated breaths as the Age of Heroes draws to an end. The Hulk finds his way. The Hulk manages to carry away Cable's weakened body to his lair while Storm chases them. But for the moment, the Green Giant has gained the upper hand. Elsewhere, Johnny Jones, another time traveler, writhes in her bed. Lost in an endless dream, Janice, taunted by her nemesis the Maestro, wakes up to the Hulk, sitting by her bed. Suddenly, the Giant begins convulsing and repeating the words, Have to destroy Cable. But it's all in vain, as this is an illusion, as the real event had already transpired many hours ago. The Hulk carries the barely conscious Cable into the Emerald Magazine Distribution Company, where we discover that the Hulk is not as unfeeling as he seems. A poster of Betty Page sends him down a self-destructive spiral, allowing Cable a chance to sneak into his psyche. Despite making his way into the Hulk's mind, Cable still faces an uphill battle as Onslaught's influence is evident everywhere in the Hulk's psyche. Cable discovers a psychic block in the form of a door. Behind this entrance lie all the secrets to Hulk's current state. Suddenly, massive boulders carrying the Hulk's face plummet down on Cable as he's jolted back to the corporeal world. Just as the Hulk is about to smash the weakened time traveler, a tornado created by Storm knocks the giant off his feet. However, in the exchange, Storm is wounded too, as a piece of debris flung by the Hulk hits her in the chest and knocks her into a body of water, and manages to find his way to a nearby gun shop, and walks out with a formidable-looking weapon. He fires, but the Hulk doesn't respond deeming the weapon to be a regular gun. However, inside the projectiles is a gas that catches the Hulk by surprise and surrounds him, causing the rage monster to flee the scene. The gas does its job, and the Hulk soon crashes to the ground. We return to Janice recovering in the Pantheon's safe house when something awakens her. She sees a golden figure towering over her, none other than the supervillain Ajax. After weakening the Hulk with the gas, Cable can finally determine the cause of his errant behavior. Onslaught's telepathic abilities have tried to crush Hulk's innate intelligence but haven't been entirely successful yet. Cable asks Storm to hit Hulk with a lightning bolt strong enough to reboot his brain. Meanwhile, Cable travels to the deep recesses of the monster's mind and finally finds the man inside the monster. He breaks a rock encasement, setting Dr. Banner free. Though the Hulk returns to the side of the heroes, Onslaught looms over the world as the greatest threat Marvel's heroes have ever faced. The next chapter of the Onslaught saga begins in London, where the populace has gone insane owing to an ancient artifact hidden under the city. In its attempt to organize a coup, the Hellfire Club has awakened this mysterious power, which is now driving the entire city of London into a violent frenzy. Inside the quarters of the Black Air Supernatural Investigation Agency, Margali Sardos is performing a dark ritual with the help of Duglock's head. We see her partner, the Red King, held in place by something whispering terrible things in his ear. As he watches, the ritual draws to a completion, and the power source is revealed. It turns out to be a demon feeding off of the city's insanity. Somewhere above the chaos, former Black Air agent Pete Wisdom is helplessly watching the scene unfold. Meanwhile, Excalibur, the British collective of mutants consisting of Colossus, Kitty Pride, Wisdom, Rain Sinclair, Megan, Kurt Wagner and their pet Lockheed are rushing to the location. As their jet hovers over the Black Air Tower, our hero spots Scrath, a Black Air agent running away. Infuriated, Wisdom jumps off of the carrier and uses his power to carry him through the air. Back inside the aircraft, Kurt readies the rest of his team for what will surely be a challenging encounter. Xavier's Secret On Muir Island, the magician Amanda Sefton appears to Moira McTaggart in a wounded state. She reveals that Margali, her mother, had been entrusted with the Soul Sword. Unfortunately, the sword corrupted her, turning Amanda's mother into the Red Queen. It corrupted Margali and implanted within her the desire to gain power from the Devil under London. Unable to stop the Queen on her own, Amanda was there to ask for help and is shocked to learn that the Excalibur are already in London. Just then, the X-Men arrive on the island on their jet, the Blackbird. Jean, Cyclops, Cannonball, Angel and Psylocke exit the ship and break the terrible news to Moira. A heartbroken Jean informs Moira, Charles Xavier has gone insane, but Moira already knows why the X-Men are at her door. There's a secret room within the island that the Professor had once used to store Shi'ar technology. It's rumored that this crypt room is the location for Xavier's greatest secret, the Xavier Protocols. In London, the Black Queen greets Brian Braddock just moments after murdering her husband, the Black King, in cold blood. She seems to be surprised that Captain Marvel somehow escaped the control effect influencing the city. Suddenly, Captain Britain is ambushed by Scribe, whose body is being possessed and controlled by Mountjoy. At the Black Air Tower, the remaining members of Excalibur plan their attack. Upon breaking in, they find the foyer of the tower to be empty, but Megan helps them to move toward the center of the event, driven to madness by the Red Queen's ritual. Colossus is forced to split from the rest of the team as he buys them valuable time by blocking the guards. Beneath Muir, 
G, Cyclops and Moira enter Xavier's secret crypt room. The room seems to be filled with cutting-edge security, but grants access to the professor's trusted students. Once inside, they're greeted by a holographic projection of Xavier, who reveals an anti-psionic suit. It turns out that the Xavier protocols were developed by the professor as the last way to stop him and his students should they become a mortal threat to humanity. Thus, the suit is designed to counter all the professor's powers. The suit is just the beginning, though. And the machine moves on to describe ways of killing the other X-Men. On the streets of London, Wisdom and his former colleague are engaged in a gruesome battle. Scratch, a seasoned killer, seems to have the upper hand. After hurting Wisdom's leg, he knocks the hero into a shop, but just as it seems that our hero has lost, Scratch is burnt to ashes by a terrifying flame. It's Lockheed, the dragon. Wisdom passes the beast a grateful smile before promising to flush him down the toilet. Inside the tower, the remaining X-Men are still struggling to make their way to the Red Queen. When the crew discovers a techno-organic version of the brood awaiting them around the corner, Megan is forced to stay behind. She holds back the creatures using her electromagnetic powers, allowing Kitty, Nightcrawler, and Wolfsbane to move on. But just across the corridor, they encounter the Red King wielding a sword. Fortunately, it only takes a moment for Nightcrawler to accept this challenge as the group's resident swordsman and defeat the Queen's companion. In another corner of the city, the Black Queen unwields her psionic blades in front of the ambushed Captain Britain. The Captain, however, uses his incredible strength to break free from Mountjoy's grip and easily incapacitates the Black Queen. But Mountjoy, slick as ever, finds an opportune moment and fires at Captain. These live bullets begin eating away at Captain Britain's force field, and finding his adversary distracted, Mountjoy runs off into the streets. By twisting inside his force field, the Captain is able to escape the projectiles and eventually manages to catch up to Mountjoy. A mighty fist appears out of the sky and pins the shapeshifter to the ground, notching another impressive victory for Britain's greatest guardian. Inside the Black Air HQ, Members of Excalibur finally emerge onto the chamber where the Red Queen is holding her ceremony. But it seems they're too late, and Doug is found to be unresponsive. Using her technological aptitude, Kitty deletes the software that had been installed into Doug to make him lose control of his body. Though Doug can now interact with the others, he still doesn't seem to be completely free of the link between him and the demon. Fortunately, Amanda makes it to the interiors of the tower just in time and teleports the others beneath the ground. Using the last ounce of her strength, she's able to seal the demon away, saving the day. While the Excalibur celebrate the success, the X-Men come to the terrible realization that their mentor had been keeping careful records on how to kill them all this while. Moira helps the X-Men download the Xavier Protocols and bids the group a teary goodbye. As the group departs, we're left with just one question. Will the Xavier Protocols be enough to stop the man who created them? Beast or Man? We find Wolverine in the middle of a raging storm, scaling the walls of the Massachusetts Academy in search of the reclusive mystic Gateway. He finds the scrawny old man perched atop the Academy's roof in a meditative state. Despite Wolverine's numerous attempts to talk to him, Gateway doesn't answer. Instead, he starts whirling the strange tool, his bull roarer, in rapid circles. These movements seem to put Wolverine into a trance, and he finds himself stuck in a distant memory. Logan watches in horror as he's made to relive the fateful night in Japan where his bride Mariko has been poisoned in the course of a battle. Writhing in excruciating pain, she cries in Wolverine's arms, Spare me the agony. Use your claws, my beloved. Helpless and unable to bear the pain, Logan is knocked off the roof and is free-falling to the ground when someone helps him break his fall and climbs in through a window. It turned out to be Electra, who revealed that she'd followed him here to set him back on the right path. The two join forces and try to approach the mystical mutant still perched on the school's roof. He's a stubborn as stick. Electra complains, but the mention of her master's name makes Gateway notice the duo. He whirls the bull roarer again, and this time, it's Electra who's transferred to a strange realm where she floats along the river Styx with a mysterious figure. There, in the depths of hell, Electra is taunted by visions of her father in the afterlife, her resurrection by the hand, and the failed romance between her and Daredevil. However, when she finally emerges back in reality, she's able to deduce that there's a reason behind Gateway's actions. Maybe Gateway's just preparing them for something much worse they'd have to endure to know the truth. Gateway uses his powers again, and this time, Wolverine and Elektra find themselves in the X-Mansion. Here, among the memories and photographs of all the X-Men, Wolverine finally tells Elektra the truth about the Professor and his new alter ego, Onslaught. Gateway acts one more time, and the two mutants are dropped on Avalon in the midst of the X-Men's last battle with Magneto. Wolverine feels the adamantium being ripped out of his body and is paralyzed by the pain. Somehow, Elektra helps him up. We then witness the battle between the Professor and Magneto. However, this time around, Wolverine is finally able to grasp what really transpired. While the Professor battles his old friend, using his powers to erase Magneto's memory, something else also emerges from the mutant psyche. This twisted homunculus attaches itself to the naive Professor, 
corrupting him. Finally, we know the secret to Onslaught's origin. That night, Wolverine finds himself sliding into despair, blaming himself for the Professor's condition. Had it not been for him, the Professor wouldn't have gone to such extremes with Magneto. Electra tries to comfort Logan, but he just laments, I used to be a man. Old friends, new foes. The X-Men aren't the only ones gathering their forces for the battle that lies ahead. Deep beneath an abandoned factory, Onslaught is probing the Dark Beast for information. Intrigued by the Beast's travel through the space-time continuum, Onslaught is looking to gather information regarding the mutants who would be sympathetic to his course. Suddenly, the psionic monster senses a new presence. A portal appears overhead, and in drops Fatal, the Dark Beast's most trusted servant. Unimpressed, Onslaught tightens his grasp, and a desperate Beast reveals, No, there are others. One inside the X-Factor, and another. Just then, with a blinding flash of light, the second Summer's sibling and the Beast's final accomplice, Havoc, appears. At X-Factor's HQ in Fall's Edge, a Sentinel acquired by Forge and Val Cooper for training the team has gone wild. Forge is just about to answer an emergency transmission when the sirens go off and the Sentinel starts wreaking havoc. Soon, Random, Mystique, Wild Child, Polaris and Shard come in to stop the massive robot. However, after a couple of exchanges, the team realized that they didn't have enough firepower and would need backup. Luckily, in a sub-basement far below Fall's Edge, they have just the answer. Sabretooth, the feral beast-like mutant, is incarcerated there, and he can already smell a visitor approach. Mystique approaches the vile mutant with half a mind to kill him, but before anything can happen, they're interrupted by Fatal, who sneaks them off in her portal. Minutes later, Fatal also appears at the scene of the X-Factor's battle and teleports the giant through one of her portals. She leaves the team confused and defeated, concerned about both the lost Sentinel and Mystique. Afraid of the danger a loose Sentinel would pose, they decide to follow the energy signals from a tracker placed by Forge inside the giant weapon. For some reason, Random tries to keep Polaris from leaving with the team, but to no avail. It's only after the team leaves that we see the unanswered emergency message that had arrived before everything went south. It was Jean Grey, informing the team of Onslaught's approach. The team arrives at the Dark Beast's lair, the abandoned Brand Core factory. Forge splits from the team and takes an alternate route around the building. Wild Child is working the front door when suddenly it glows red hot and bursts apart in a sudden explosion. On the other side stands their former teammate, Havoc. He's accompanied by Fatal, who sneers at our hero's disbelief and taunts Polaris, Your boyfriend's mine now. Despite Polaris's disbelief, it's evident that this is not the same Alex Summers that the world had once known. Polaris tries to reason with him despite Random's protests, but her former lover suddenly fires a massive blast in her direction. At the last second, Lorna conjures a magnetic shield that barely holds up against the power of the blast. While Polaris struggles to make her defense last, Fatal tells the team that she's been authorized to cut an offer. If they surrendered and volunteered to be a part of Onslaught's genetic experiments, they would get to live. The team denies Fatal's offer, but then the teleporter turns to Random and says, Time to get to work. And don't give me any of that, I'm exactly where I belong, garbage. You had no problem bringing Summers to the boss. To everyone's utter shock, Random turns against X-Factor and points his weaponized arm straight at Wild Child. While the team battles outside, Forge manages to sneak inside the factory, where a terrifying sight awaits him. Rows of battle-ready sentinels stand in the basement, being configured for their final launch. But before Forge can make sense of this occurrence, a giant hand breaks through the walls and grabs him. Outside, the battle has grown even more intense. Betrayed by two of her closest aides, Polaris is devastated. Just as Random and Havoc are about to launch their next round of attacks, the walls of the factory begin to shake. Suddenly, the battle is interrupted by Forge and Post, who are engaged in a battle of their own. Forge tells X-Factor about the Sentinels, and this helps Polaris to gather herself. She faces off against Havoc, but Alex is too powerful. For a moment, it seems like Polaris is about to be killed by the man she once loved, but Random suddenly aims his gun at Alex. Havoc realizes this and turns his attack toward Random, who suffers a brutal hit. Unable to hold his form together, he goes back to his real avatar, that of a scrawny teenager. While Havoc is distracted, Polaris apologizes to her lover before hitting him with a powerful magnetic pulse. However, we soon realize that despite X-Factor's valiant efforts, it's all been in vain. The ground shudders, and pillars of smoke rise into the sky. One by one, the Sentinels are let loose upon the world. Freefall While the X-Factor is stuck at the abandoned factory, Patal transports Mystique and Sabretooth to a mysterious underground cavern. Here, the duo are greeted by an unlikely host. The Beast. Apparently, he seems to make them an offer so good that they can't refuse. He leads his surprised guests deeper into the caves, 
where they discover the Beast's hidden laboratory. Here, the Dark Beast finally explains to Mystique and Sabretooth that he isn't actually the real McCoy. He invites them to join his master, Onslaught, and offers them a gift, Forge. The leader of the X-Factor pops in through one of Fatal's portals. Then, with a click, the Dark Beast deactivates the inhibitor and neural implant that had been placed inside Mystique and Sabretooth by Forge. The Dark Beast offers Forge to the duo, believing that he would become the subject of their wrath. Instead, Mystique and Sabretooth attack the Dark Beast. During the fight, we see Mystique use her powers in a new way, surprising the Dark Beast. Her ability to specifically morph certain parts of her body to replicate other mutants sparks the villain's interest. Working together, Forge, Mystique, and Sabretooth are able to injure the monster, but their opponent has one final trick up his sleeve. A portal appears and sneaks off the villain, but not before he assures our heroes that the real McCoy will soon be dead. Hank vs. Hank The issue begins with Forge reactivating the implants in Sabretooth and Mystique while they're distracted. Having already failed to stop the Sentinel launch, the team finds themselves in a desperate position. They decide to split into three groups to make the search for the real beast quicker. Shard and Polaris are left behind to stand guard over Random and Havoc. Wild Child goes with Mystique, while Forge accompanies Sabretooth. The two teams head into the building and start making their way into the complex system of tunnels underneath the abandoned factory. Wild Child tells Mystique that he's surprised to be working with her again. The two strike up a conversation and Wild Child tries to get under Mystique's skin by telling her that she'd be a good mum. Mystique retorts by asking Wild Child whether he was just longing for the parents who had abandoned him. While the two pester each other, the floor underneath their feet suddenly gives away. Mystique is just about to fall into the hole when Wild Child grabs her hair and pulls her back. Despite this close shave, the road ahead is blocked. Mystique, with an enigmatic smile, asks Wild Child to hold on tight for the wild ride ahead. Meanwhile, Forge and Sabretooth are battling mechanical tentacles designed to keep intruders away. The two make short work of the obstructions when Forge's tracer suddenly goes off, indicating that Hank is near. Sabretooth tears through the walls and they finally emerge into the secret chamber where the beast is being held. But before they can free their comrade, Fatal appears and blocks their way. Sabretooth is ready to pounce on her, but the battle is stopped before it can begin. Wild Child and Mystique appear above them, flying thanks to Angel's old wings being manifested by Mystique. Wild Child drops a heavy strike on Fatal, and the teleporter is finally defeated. Outside the factory, Polaris is still devastated by Havoc and Random's betrayal. Random tries to defend himself and narrates how it was McCoy who took care of him and trained him to control his powers. The poor boy had no option other than to obey his father figure, but he still wouldn't do anything to hurt Lorna. He tries to assure her. Well, after all, he loves her. But Lorna doesn't respond. But then Alex tries to get under her skin. As her former lover, he's able to convince Polaris that he's broken through the Dark Beast's mind control. Control. Weakened by her emotions, Polaris gives in and undoes Havoc's shackles. He's lying! Yells random and turns back to his adult form. But it's too late. Alex, now free, lets his powers push to the limit. With a massive blast, he obliterates random and turns him into a sentient fluid. Random manages to slither into the sewer and escape. This prompts Shard to follow him, leaving Polaris alone to face her former lover. Inside the factory, the team finally seems to succeed. Beast, grateful at being freed, begins to rush away in haste, only to be stopped by the Sabretooth. Actually, Sabretooth's superior sense of smell has detected a neat little trick, and he refuses to let Beast go. Despite the other members' protests, Sabretooth acts upon his hunch and smashes the wall behind the Beast, revealing a hidden chamber. It's in there that we find the real Hank McCoy. Finally awakened, the X-Man rushes at his imposter and knocks him out with ease. However, upon emerging outside, the team learns that Polaris is grievously injured, agrees to teleport them to the nearest hospital. But it's evident that this is just another step in the Dark Beast's elaborate scheme. The Spider and the Sentinels Many miles away, Ben Riley, the new Spider-Man, is still oblivious to Onslaught's existence. For the moment, his greatest concern is the recent crime spree, consisting of multiple robberies, all pointing to different members of his rogues gallery. But the perpetrator is a man called Norton G. Fester, who's gained numerous powers from a mysterious meteorite. Also known as the Looter, Norton is a master thief who's been committing crimes by using weapons acquired from the Ringer, the Trapster, the Mauler, and the Shocker. Hidden in his lair, the villain dreams about stealing the final component of his master plan. Perplexed by the crimes, Ben is forced to visit Peter Parker and his wife Mary Jane at the hospital. There, we find that Mary is expecting, and owing to this, Peter is confined to the hospital. However, after some brainstorming, Peter helps Ben pick out some clues from the newspapers, and the new Spidey sets off to the suspected location for the next robbery. As expected, the place is attacked by the looter, who manages to abduct Spider-Man and bind him with his own webbing. The villain then proceeds to explain his plan to the webhead, but before Norton's schemes can materialize, Spidey's webbing dissolves. This leads to a massive battle, and the looter is eventually defeated. However, before Spider-Man can even take in his success, he feels his spider senses tingle, 
as he looks up to the sky. The reason becomes clear. The Sentinels have made it to New York City. New York Falls. Oblivious to the Sentinels' arrival, Peter and MJ are making their way across the 59th Street Bridge when suddenly, their path is blocked by a giant Sentinel standing in their way. The robot announces to the confused travelers, By order of Onslaught, this city is under martial law. All mutants and enhanced humans are hereby commanded to surrender or suffer immediate termination. The robot sensors detect Peter's presence, who barely manages to escape as a deadly energy blast hits their automobile. Jumping to a higher ground with MJ, Peter is finally able to catch a glimpse of the city, now completely overrun by deadly robots. Peter watches helplessly, having given up the mantle of Spider-Man after losing his powers. However, something about the situation reawakens his abilities, and for the moment, Peter is able to hold his own against the robots. Across the city, the offices of the Daily Bugle are under attack. We see a sentinel plunge his arm into the building, and the workers are forced to evacuate. While the others move into the basement, Ben Riley is streaking across rooftops, changing into his costume. Inside the shelter, a mother tries to comfort a child by telling him about guardian angels like Spider-Man, who would undoubtedly protect them. Out on the streets, the battle continues. Peter and MJ are detected by a sentinel while fleeing, which leads Peter to abandon his wife and distract the robot. However, during the chase, Pete's powers start faltering again. Fortunately, this misleads the Sentinels, who take off, thinking Peter to be a normal human being. Stuck inside the Daily Bugle, J. Jonah Jameson is trying to keep the news running despite the attack on his office. Suddenly, the Sentinels' attack stop, and Jameson peers out the window, half expecting Spider-Man to be the one stopping the killer robot. But to everyone's surprise, it turns out to be Green Goblin fighting the good fight. The new goblin who accidentally acquired the Green Goblin's abilities during a visit to the Oscorp Tower. Now, seeing his city being attacked by the Sentinels, Phil finds himself drawn to its defense. After donning his costume, Phil engages the Sentinel, but he finds himself considerably overmatched. After a couple of exchanges, the robot swats the goblin off his glider, now injured and alone in a dark alley. A cowering Phil ditches the mask as the Sentinels wouldn't deem him a threat without its powers. However, this cowardly act doesn't sit well with his conscience, and after a brief moment of contemplation, the goblin attacks the Sentinel one more time. The goblin tricks the hulking murder machine and drives his glider straight through the monster's head. Though the sentinel is soundly defeated, the ensuing explosion knocks the goblin back, destroying his mask. This effectively strips Phil of all powers, and goblin is rendered completely helpless on the battlefield. With the sentinel defeated, Pete decides to leave MJ at the comparatively safe offices of the Daily Bugle. Though powerless, Peter walks back into the battle with just a camera at his disposal. Meanwhile, Pete's clone, Ben Riley, is slinging over the head of a sentinel, trying to take a behemoth down. Ben uses his impact webbing to knock the robot off its feet and uses the opening to tear through the monster's head using a manhole cover. At long last, Spider-Man has finally figured out how to take these mutant murdering machines down. The Tale of Two Spider-Men Peter is scrambling along the roofs, camera in hand. With his powers faltering, all Pete can do is photograph the giants terrifying the city. Suddenly, he feels his spider sense returning, and a familiar buzz cuts through Peter's head. He turns to find two sentinels in pursuit of his clone, the new Spider-Man, Ben. We see multiple sentinels closing in on Ben, and one even manages to grasp the spider in his fist. Just as the robot's about to terminate Ben, it notices someone else in the vicinity. It's Peter who's trying to divert the robot's attention. However, with his powers failing, he's helpless against the massive mutant hunter. The Sentinel charges its weapon and is just about to fire at Peter when Ben recovers and blinds the robot with his webbing. The two Spider-Men flee, but a massive blast catches Ben mid-swing. They fall down an industrial chimney, where we find that Ben has suffered considerable wounds. Ben rips at the ground, unearthing a small manhole at the base of the chimney, and they escape further into the sewers below. However, it's all in vain as the Sentinels rip through layers of concrete and rock until it all comes tumbling down. Afraid that this would be the end of the road, Ben hands his web shooters to Peter and asks him to go back to his wife. Ben stays behind, trying to hold the fort. The Sentinels descend on him with brutal force. Ben manages to defeat one of them by hurling a metal pipe through its temple. But the other robots are too much for the lone spider, and Ben ends up getting caught. The robot looms over him, charging his weapon when a web wraps around its head and pulls it away. It seems like Peter's powers have returned, at least for the moment. In a tremendous display of strength and skill, Pete rips off the Sentinel's head and uses it as a wrecking ball to destroy the other robots. After winning the battle, Peter dives into the ruins to find a recovering Ben. Do you have any idea what we're up against? Pete asks Ben. Some guy called Onslaught, Ben tells Peter, and the X-Men are taking him. Right there, the two spiders decide to join the fight. Sinister Intentions We find Mr. Sinister in Egypt. He's come there to test his fears, to find out if the ancient mutant apocalypse really lives again. 
As expected, Apocalypse's sarcophagus is found to be empty. Sinister finds this intriguing. Almost as intriguing as the new player Onslaught who had recently cast his shadow all over the planet. That Sinister isn't really worried as he knows that it's in the worst of times that all things become possible. Under the ruins of the X-Mansion, Nate Grey waits for news. As one of the primary targets of Onslaught, it's essential to keep him from the villain's clutches. To ensure this, he's being guarded by the second-generation team of mutants, X-Force. Domino, Siren, Sunspot, Caliban, and Meltdown surround the Time Traveler. Their camaraderie makes Nate reminisce about his own time when he, too, had friends. He tells Domino that he had once known a woman like her once. That Domino, a cold-blooded mercenary, was a far cry from the woman that now stood before him. Left alone and of no practical use in the war efforts, Nate grows frustrated. Moreover, he's further dismayed by his inability to reach the one person who really needs him. In the heart of Upper West Manhattan, Threnody rests inside the St. John Cathedral. Weary and alone, she prays, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against. Born with the power to absorb and rechannel the energies released in death, Threnody has always been a target. Tonight, however, she's an especially easy target and soon attracts the attention of the Marauders. Arclight, Harpoon, Scalp Hunter, and Vertigo break in through the skylight. Vertigo's attack sends Threnody reeling, but somehow she's able to evade Scalp Hunter's gunfire. The stunned projectiles hit Vertigo instead. Threnody uses her powers to channel Vertigo's pain and releases it back at the Marauders, knocking them all out. Her efforts are in vain, however, as she finds his escape blocked by none other than Mr. Sinister. Some 30 minutes later, the X-Force discovers that the security measures outside the mansion are failing. Fearing an attack, the team retreats further into the mansion, where the alien warrior Shatterstar joins them. To counter the enemy, the team splits up and heads after the intruder. Despite the Siren's protests, Nate accompanies them. Soon, Siren and the tracker Caliban chance upon the intruder, Sinister, but are silenced before they act. The rest of the team travels into the ammunition vault and gears up for the ensuing battle. Suddenly, an explosion rocks the mutants and the villain, Mr. Sinister, finally reveals himself. We catch glimpses of the Sinister and Nate's twisted history. After all, it was Sinister who had artificially created Nate from genetic material obtained from Cyclops and Jean Grey. Memories flood in, and Nate notices the similarity between Mr. Sinister and the man who slaughtered Forge back in his timeline. The battle begins abruptly as the X-Force attacks Sinister with all their might. However, their high-tech weapons have little effect. Unhindered by the rest of the team, Sinister focuses on what he deems to be a specimen of genetic perfection, Nate, the X-Man. He tells Nate that it was his arrival in this reality that was to blame for the arrival of Onslaught. It was Nate who gave the Psy-Beast access to its armor while forcibly pulling Xavier from the astral plane. Nate, confused and perplexed, finds himself succumbing to Sinister's attack. Nate's power, though tremendous, is still crude and uncontained, and he finds himself helpless against Sinister's control. A victorious Sinister proclaims, You are power incarnate, but I, I am control. X-Factor vs. Sinister The X-Factor is a loss. Most are still recovering from the last attack. Only Domino stands adamantly, but she knows she'll be no match against such a powerful foe. Caliban, the Morlock, is especially perplexed. The Tracker is confused by all the activity by Onslaught, and even by Sinister's arrival. All he knows is that his head is on fire. Suddenly, he plunges at Sinister, feral and unhinged. It turns out that during his time as the Apocalypse's horseman, Caliban had been fitted with a failsafe against Sinister. A raging Caliban attacks Sinister, who's surprised by the Morlock's newfound strength. This spurt of strength allows Caliban to pin down Sinister with an almost bestial ferocity. The X-Factor recovers and is surprised to find the gentle friend replaced by a merciless monster tearing their foe to shreds. Taking this opportunity, Domino sets off the mansion's self-destruct sequence. Moments later, the X-Man's base of operations goes up in a terrifying ball of flames. Outside the school's compound, X-Factor's strongest member, Warpath, is making his return from Florida. A new friend, Risqué, accompanies him and the two seem deep in love. However, the towering flames in the distance clearly indicate that something is very wrong at the Institute. Inside the debris of Xavier's school, Sinister comes back to his senses. Sunspot, Domino, and Nate have retreated deeper into the mansion, where Nate reveals that his powers have been shut down by Sinister. Meanwhile, Caliban and Meltdown have been knocked down even further into the sewers. Caliban has just gotten back to his senses and finds himself just as confused as the other. Caliban was out of control. He mutters to Meltdown. Finding her friend scared and disturbed, Meltdown embraces Caliban and assures him, you're not going to hurt anybody. As they flee, Domino tries to figure out why Sinister could shut off Nate's powers but not Cable's. Together, they deduce that it might be due to the protective aura arising from the Ascani teaching taught to Cable from a very young age. Nate probes Sunspot to learn more about the Ascani and suddenly conjures Blacksmith, Cable's mentor. The psychic image knocks both Nate and Sunspot while providing no clear answers. 
Siren and Shatterstar have already been defeated by Sinister, but in his overconfidence, Sinister fails to notice Warpath, who knocks him over with a massive punch. Simultaneously, Risqué attacks the villain with the inorganic matter nearby. Together, they are able to stall Sinister enough for Nate to gain his powers again. Now armed with Ascani's secrets, the X-Man attacks Sinister on all fronts, psychologically, physically, and telekinetically. Finally, it seems like the heroes have won. However, Sinister has one final trick up his sleeve. He lures Nate to probe him psychologically to unearth secrets about the apocalypse, but uses the opportunity to rechannel his energy back at the X-Factor. With one fell swoop, he defeats the X-Factor. Slinging Nate's unconscious body over his shoulder, Sinister mutters, Now we can begin. The Punisher is recruited. In New York, the vigilante Frank Castle, aka the Punisher, watches helplessly as the city falls. Sentinels stand among the skyscrapers and smoke blows into the night. All the bridges and tunnels out of the city have been shut, but a lone shield helicarrier has made it through the barricade. The Punisher wishes that the former head of S.H.I.E.L.D. was alive, but then he was the one who killed him. Inside the helicarrier, S.H.I.E.L.D.'s new chief, G.W. Bridge, is assessing the situation with his fellow agents. Soon, paragliding troopers will be deployed in the streets. Unfortunately, the Sentinels detect this maneuver, and the robots promptly shoot the helicarrier out of the sky. The Punisher rushes to save the people aboard while the aircraft sinks further into the cold waters. But the helicarrier's fall is also noticed by others, like the infamous junkyard dogs and their leader, Rashid Hammer-Jones. These thieves rush toward the sinking carrier in order to steal the high-tech equipment on board. Despite heavy casualties, GW Bridge and the High Command survive the attack and are struggling to find their feet. The agents start evacuating as their commander configures the self-destruct feature. However, the agents' escape is blocked by the dogs, who start firing upon the desperate survivors. Fortunately, the Punisher is there to help. He diverts the attackers and hides in the remnants of the aircraft. While evading the assailant's gunfire, he makes a misstep and is about to take a plunge when he's saved by Bridge. Together, the two soldiers take up all the dogs' attention, allowing their S.H.I.E.L.D. members to escape. Following this, they escape the carrier just moments before it's blown up by the Sentinels. Once ashore, Frank decides to work as a team player for once and joins the S.H.I.E.L.D. in order to defeat the monster onslaught. Total Invasion New York is totally overrun by Sentinels. The giant robots face no resistance, save for the few heroes that have managed to gather on top of the Fall Freedoms Plaza. There, high above the falling city, our heroes are gathering their forces. We see the Fantastic Four and Avengers stand together in this dark hour, trying to assess the situation. They are also accompanied by Bishop and Iceman. Xavier's found his soldiers, Captain America remarks. Iceman reminds Steve not to call the psionic monster Xavier. Call them Onslaught, he says. In response to Bishop's inquiries about Magneto, the captain calls forth the Master of Magnetism, now de-aged and cleansed of his criminal tendencies. He's also accompanied by a former member of the X-Men, Rogue. Tensions are high, especially for Sue Storm, whose son Franklin has been abducted by Onslaught for his reality-warping abilities. The teams scatter across New York City. Captain America, The Thing, Scarlet Witch, Iceman, Human Torch, Gambit, Magneto, Rogue, Hawkeye, and Vision stay above ground to fight. Meanwhile, Giant Man, Bishop, Iron Man, Reed Richards, and Sue Storm start working on a weapon that would be powerful enough to take down their formidable foe. Somewhere in an alternate realm, Onslaught and Charlie are convincing the innocent Franklin to become a part of their devious scheme. Helpless and all alone, all the poor child can do is watch as Onslaught begins harvesting his dormant power. Meanwhile, the X-Men are flying across the Atlantic after receiving the Xavier Protocols from Moira McTaggart. The files contain detailed information on how to terminate members of the X-Men and could be the only way to truly stop Onslaught. Inside the Four Freedoms Plaza, some of the world's brightest minds are trying to find a solution to the problems posed by Onslaught's abilities. In the wreckage of Nathaniel Richards' armor, Iron Man finds a piece of tech that could protect the team if Onslaught were to take over Franklin's powers. The battle for New York is in full swing. With their combined efforts, the heroes are finally achieving some success against the robots. We find Rogue and Magneto working together to take down one of the Sentinels, but another one manages to sneak behind them. Fortunately, Gambit is there to save the two. It's evident that Gambit is uncomfortable with the strange connection between the de-aged Magneto and his former lover, Rogue. Suddenly, the heroes are interrupted by a Nova Flash from the direction of Central Park. Like a dawning sun, the light grows and blinds the city. When the light recedes, a humongous Ebon Citadel is left behind towering over the city skyscrapers. Standing on top of his castle, Onslaught declares to the world, From this day forwards, the humans shall no longer inherit the earth. No more shall mutant kind be so savagely oppressed, but today marks the ultimate ascension of the Homo Superior race. With a small gesture, Onslaught sets forth a massive EMP, a magnetic pulse boosted tremendously by the monster's telekinetic abilities. The attack fries the circuitry in almost every piece of machinery, including Vision's body and Iron Man's armor. 
More importantly, the attackers also destroyed the hero's weapons and shorted the device carrying the Xavier protocols. As the Blackbird comes crashing to the ground, it's clear that Onslaught has made his first move. Onslaught's new form Somewhere deep inside the core of the monster known as Onslaught, Franklin Richards has finally found the wounded body of Professor X. The Professor is frozen in his place, the telepath's eyes wide open with shock. Frank tries to wake the Professor, but the old man is too far gone. The child turns over his shoulder, only to find Onslaught standing guard. The monster has taken a newer, more terrifying form after absorbing Franklin's powers. Now he's stronger than ever. It is certain that escape from this nightmarish realm will not be easy. Out on the streets of New York, the battle has been raging for hours. The Watcher and Apocalypse are watching from a distance while chaos consumes everything. Maybe Onslaught will survive. Apocalypse wonders. As a consequence of Onslaught's electromagnetic pulse, every piece of technology in the entire city has gone dead, leaving the population in disarray. Heroes like Iron Man and Vision are put out of action. The rest, like Iceman, Human Torch and Hawkeye, regroup on the battlefield and are soon joined by members of the X-Men and Fantastic Four. Sue Storm looks at the ruins around her and decides to join the fight above ground. I will not abandon my son, Invisible Woman states to her husband. Nearby, Magneto can feel the power trapped inside the metal subway tubes. He rips the train out of the ground in an effort to save its occupants. However, the people inside the train cower in fear after seeing the Master of Magnetism before them. He asks Gambit about what kind of man he used to be before his memories were taken away. Gambit tries to comfort the reformed villain, but Magneto... Disturbed by his own sins, takes the entire blame for the situation upon himself. He leaps off the roof, stating, It's incumbent on me to end this threat. In the wake of Magneto's departure, the former lovers Rogue and Gambit reconcile in a loving embrace. Inside Onslaught, Franklin has finally managed to wake Charles Xavier. The founder of the X-Men finds himself powerless in these circumstances, but embraces the small child with affection. Ah, this Onslaught is a very bad man, the professor explains. However, just then, Onslaught interrupts the two. He makes Franklin disappear into thin air while the Professor desperately tries to hold on to the child. It's evident that without his powers, the Professor is easy prey for this worthy adversary. Inside the Four Freedoms Plaza, Reed Richards is working hard to revive the fallen heroes. Jean is impressed by the Fantastic Four's leader and his uncanny ability to remain level-headed despite the great personal stakes. Iron Man slowly comes back to his senses as his vitals stabilize. Despite being heavily wounded, Stark rises to his feet and starts his work on the psionic armor mentioned in the Xavier Protocols. At Onslaught's Citadel, the psionic monster has reached an unprecedented amount of power after fusing the minds of Professor X and Franklin Richards. Cyclops and Sue Storm are watching the travesty unfold from a distance when they're joined by Cable and Storm. Out of nowhere, Magneto confronts the physical body of Onslaught and attacks him with a powerful magnetic pulse. This draws the monster's attention, but he doesn't seem to be concerned. Turning to our heroes, the creature morphs and reveals an opening in his chest. Inside that black void, we find the Professor, and Onslaught uses the Professor's agony to taunt the X-Men. The heroes attack with all their might. Magneto finds that his powers are even more effective now, thanks to certain tweaks by Cable. Cyclops takes off his visor and unloads the full strength of his optic blasts at Onslaught. The cracks in the villain's torso grow further, and he seems to weaken. Within these cracks, we can see the Professor, now existing simultaneously on the astral and corporeal planes. With a final plunge, Thor dives through Onslaught's massive body and breaks through to the other side. This effort also ends up freeing the Professor from Onslaught. But instead of being weakened, Onslaught seems to have grown even stronger. Apparently, being rid of the Professor has allowed Onslaught to gain complete control of its faculties. With a bloodthirsty scream, he launches a terrible attack, merging the powers of Xavier, Magneto, and Franklin Richards. A glowing orb of destruction engulfs the city. Sue Storm has managed to survive the attack. However, she finds her son's absence to be a fate even worse than death. For the moment, though, the X-Men are relieved. Their mentor is free at last, but he doesn't seem to have his powers anymore. A little away from the battle zone, Apocalypse and the Watcher quietly acknowledge the threat posed by Onslaught. The Watcher reveals to Apocalypse that the key to defeating this unprecedented threat lies with the man from the future, Cable. Joining forces, the Watcher, Uatu, looks upon the planet as humanity falls. This saddens him, but he's forbidden from interfering, as mandated by the rules of his species. He fears that the Age of Heroes is at its end, and the Herald of Armageddon would be the psionic monster, Onslaught. In the midst of the psionic hurricane set forth by Onslaught, Cable and Sue Storm are huddled together in the protection of a dismembered sentinel head. Cable's virus has clearly worsened, and one of his arms has morphed into a horrific shape. Our heroes are already in dire straits when they see a sight more nightmarish than anything they could have expected. The ancient mutant, Apocalypse himself, is towering over the duo in perfect range for an attack. Blinded by rage, Cable ignores Apocalypse's words and proceeds to attack the villain over and over again. Undeterred, Apocalypse reiterates that he has a method to separate Onslaught from Franklin Richards. This prompts Sue Storm to stop the fight, giving Apocalypse a chance to make his case. 
She emphasizes that if Apocalypse can separate her son from Onslaught, they ought to listen to him. Cable agrees, although hesitantly, but urges Sue to stay back in the real world while he and Apocalypse travel to an astral plane to rescue Franklin. In the astral plane, Cable and Apocalypse can barely get along together. The two bitter enemies argue and bicker while making their way to Onslaught's core. Cable is able to use the astral plane's power to bring the Techno virus back under his control. Finally, they reach their destination to find that Onslaught has grown far beyond either Magneto or Professor X. With his terrifying power, he's holding Franklin hostage inside himself. Despite all of Cable's and Apocalypse's efforts, the two are detected instantaneously by the psionic monster, who attacks them using psi projects of the Hulk, Magneto, and Post. While Cable is holding off these projections, Apocalypse manages to get to Franklin and reveals his true plan. The Ancient One plans to kill the kid as a sacrifice to take away the source of Onslaught's power, but Cable has already planned a fail-safe. He calls out to the Invisible Woman, who reveals herself and drives Apocalypse away from their son. Sue is just about to reach Franklin when Onslaught uses his might to separate the mother and the child one more time. Sue, Cable, and Apocalypse are teleported back to the real world, a valuable chance slipping away from their fingertips. Apocalypse disappears, disgusted by the hero's inability to sacrifice for the greater good. However, Uatu reminds the Ancient One that the ends never justify such extreme means. Meanwhile, Cable and his mother's valiant actions have sparked a new hope inside Franklin Richards, who bides time for his chance. Dreams and Reality The last time we saw the X-Force, their entire team had been knocked off by a powerful psionic blast by Mr. Sinister. Roberto da Costa finds himself engrossed in a soccer game in Brazil, being cheered on by hundreds of spectators and his parents. Also present is Roberto's lady love, Juliana Sandoval. The crowd erupts with joy as Roberto scores the final goal. This world seems to be perfectly ideal, but the voice in Roberto's head starts taunting him. The realization that he's an outsider dawns upon Roberto, and his powers start blazing. Suddenly, he's greeted by the vision of a young man who beckons him to get up. The boy has come to fetch Roberto first, as without him, the X-Force will not follow. In the real world, Siren is the only survivor of Onslaught's attack. She plunges into the ruins of X-Mansion to find her team unconscious, desperate, and alone. Siren reaches out to Cable with her thoughts, but a huge burst of psionic feedback cuts off their communication. Siren realizes that it will be up to her to save the day. We then enter Tabitha's dream, where the hot-headed mutant is locked in battle against the Sabretooth. She defeats the beast over and over again as if lost in a loop. However, Sunspot and the mysterious child approach her in the dream. Roberto persuades Tabitha to escape this nightmare, and Meltdown is finally able to look beyond the illusion. We then travel to Caliban's vision, where the Morlock sees himself as an alien crash landing in a farm. He's found and adopted by Cable and Domino a loving couple that takes a liking to the lost alien. This simple existence is all Caliban ever craved for. However, this peaceful dream is interrupted when Sunspot arrives to rescue his teammate. Following this, we enter Warpath's dream, where he's traveling across his native pastures with his brother, Thunderbird. Thunderbird had perished in one of the team's missions, but here, in this magical realm, the two brothers exist together. But we already know what's coming. Sunspot and the other X-Force members appear in front of Warpath and convince him to snap out of the dream. Following this, they travel to Shatterstar, who seems to have attended a place in Valhalla, the final sanctuary of warriors. Here, under an idyllic tree, Star seems to have found a restful place. Though hesitant, he listens to his comrades, and the team is able to rescue him from the dream too. The final step is Domino, who's lost in the darkness. Unlike the others, Domino is not in a scenic place but instead in a void, devoid of everything. Finally, the assassin does not feel threatened. The team comes to her aid, but Domino reveals to Sunspot that she finds comfort in the emptiness. A desperate Sunspot insists, without you we can't be at our best. Domino settles down and rejoins the team, but their reunion is interrupted by the mysterious child who had first appeared to Sunspot. It turns out that the child is nothing but a manifestation of Onslaught, designed to show the X-Force their ideal lives. Just a trick to make the hero switch over to the villain's side. However, the team sticks together, and with their combined resolve, they manage to break free from Onslaught's illusion. As they wake up to Siren praying beside them, the team knows that they've overcome one of their toughest challenges yet. Arriving back into the corporeal world, X-Force finds their mysterious guide still lingering amongst them. The figure introduces himself as the goodness of a young Charles Xavier, an entity that even Onslaught couldn't destroy. He congratulates the X-Force and motivates them for the war that awaits the next generation of mutant heroes. Shades of Grey X-Man vs. Sinister In the depths of his lair, Mr. Sinister, the master geneticist, is enjoying his triumph. After years of patience and scheming, he finally has his ultimate creation. He finally has his ultimate creation, Nate Grey, back in his possession. As a final gesture of kindness, Sinister extends Nate an offer to join his side voluntarily. Never, murderer, Nate answers defiantly. But when Sinister reveals that he's also abducted Nate's companion, Threnody, the young mutant loses his cool and lashes out at his abductor. 
This action, however, is in vain, as Sinister quickly neutralizes X-Man. The Big Apple is still overrun with Sentinels despite the combined efforts of our heroes. Under the dying city, Trinity is held prisoner by the Marauders, Scalp Hunter, and Arclight. Heavy chains bind her to the wall where her captors taunt her about Nate's inability to help her. Despite being cloned over and over, it's clear that Scalp Hunter and Arclight still harbor feelings for each other. Though evil, at least they're still human. Onslaught, on the other hand, is something else entirely. A psionic entity in possession of some of the greatest mutant powers in the world is trying to remake the world in his image. Especially useful in this endeavor are the reality-warping abilities Onslaught absorbed by Franklin Richards. While the villain reshapes the world, Franklin himself is trapped inside the monster, helplessly crying for his mother. Soundly defeated by his creator, Nate lies on the floor of the villain's lair. Suddenly, he hears a faint whisper in his head, but Sinister asks him to ignore it. Sinister then shows Nate visions from his own reality, where Apocalypse is standing victorious over a mountain of skeletons. But did you not think there could be someone even worse than Apocalypse? I know there is. Nate answers, you. Nate uses all his psychic might to conjure his own visions of the future and show Sinister all the crimes the villain had committed. Nate narrates how, because of his power, he's been hunted across two worlds. All he ever wanted was not to be treated like a weapon. But in Sinister's eyes, Nate is and has always been a weapon of war designed to be wielded at his hands. However, the voice inside Nate's head is growing stronger, and upon realizing who it could be, Sinister immediately warns Nate against listening to it. Deep within the sewers of New York, Trinity has finally found a means to escape. She kills a rat and uses the bioenergy to break her bones. She scampers through the familiar tunnels as fast as she can, but suddenly, Scalp Hunter and Arclight pounce upon her and obstruct her path ahead. However, before the confrontation can reach its conclusion, the trio is suddenly interrupted by a mysterious entity. Sinister holds Nate down using long organic tendrils emerging from the ground. Nate tries to keep them off but is unsuccessful in his attempts. Now, cornered and desperate, Nate ponders on Sinister's ability to shut his powers. Wagering that it was a one-time trick, X-Man takes his chances and is able to use telekinesis to free himself from Sinister's grip. He returns to the ground and places his hand on Sinister's shoulder, stating, You're right, it's all about control control of me. At that very instant, a portal appears beside them, and the lost child, Franklin Richards, peers from within. Nate tries to grab a hold of the kid, but it turns out to be just an illusion. Within a split second, Onslaught takes his true form and drags Nate into his dark portal. The Hulk takes his shot. Amid the Battle of New York, a train full of passengers is stuck in the subway tunnels. The occupants call desperately for help, but to no avail. Suddenly, their prayers are answered, and the train begins to move. They peer out the windows to find the green rage monster pulling the train out. Despite this, the passengers show clear signs of fear at the Hulk's appearance. However, Bruce Banner is accustomed to this treatment and believes that by saving these people, he's taking back a small piece of his mind. They bring the train out to the surface, and rescue helpers begin evacuating the passengers. The Avengers are not having one of their finest moments. Most of them are wounded and battered, struggling to recover from Onslaught's attacks. As the Hulk walks into the building, everyone inside goes silent, and it's evident that the others are not really comfortable with the Green Goliath. Stop looking at me like that unless you want me to go over to the other side. He taunts the other superheroes. Falcon comes to his friend's defense and convinces the others that they'd be much stronger with the Hulk than without him. Walking over to Captain America, Hulk insists that the Avengers should mount their attack on Onslaught instead of recuperating. He wants to go on the offensive as it could offer the heroes an advantage in combat. However, Captain America counters Hulk's strategy by reminding Banner that the heroes ended up paying dearly the last time they attacked the Psy monster in haste. The Hulk, however, stands unconvinced, and a furious debate sparks between the two. While the two heroes argue, Falcon explains to Hawkeye how Hulk was there for his cousin Jim Jones when he passed away. Unlike what most people assumed, the Hulk wasn't really a monster. Unable to come to a conclusion, the captain leaves Hulk to do what he must. Hulk leaves for Onslaught's castle with a small renegade force of volunteers consisting of Crystal, Falcon, and the Vision. The group embarks on their journey and decides to attack the villain's castle from underneath. The Hulk starts ripping through the earth toward the villain's lair, while Crystal uses her powers to manipulate the earth to keep it from caving in. Suddenly, the Hulk realizes that the Onslaught has become aware of their presence. Furiously, he digs himself up to the surface inside Onslaught's castle, and the battle ensues. Having suffered his attacks before, the Hulk can tell the monster's powers are weakened. The Hulk subjects the villain to his full power, bashing against his chest until Onslaught's armor cracks. For a moment, the Hulk thinks that the battle is won, but he soon realizes Onslaught's trick. The encounter was but an illusion, and the crew finds themselves still trapped in the tunnel. Onslaught asks the Hulk to come over to his side, and the Goliath finds that he has no answer for his foe's taunts. The Iron Man and the Vibranium Monarch 
In another corner of the fallen city, Iron Man, Quicksilver, and Giant Man are making their way through the sewers, trying to remain undetected by the Sentinels. Tony Stark peers through a manhole cover and looks upon the towering robot head. He thinks about how this world of heroes and villains is still so new to him. After all, this is a younger version of Tony, who's just recently joined the Avengers. Descending back into the tunnels, Tony informs his comrades that access to the Wakandan consulate has been completely shut off by Onslaught's guards. However, Hank seems to be impressed by the fact that due to Tony's innate lack of powers, he was able to go unnoticed by the Sentinels. The group is discussing alternate ways to procure the Psy Shields essential to fight Onslaught when they're interrupted by someone in the shadows. The figure comes into the light, and we see T'Challa, the warrior prince of the sovereign nation of Wakanda. This is an extremely fortunate encounter for our heroes, as T'Challa can now grant them unfettered access to the consulate's equipment. Quicksilver rushes ahead of the others, but soon finds his way blocked by a rapidly approaching wall of water. This leads Giant Man to increase in size and break above ground to release the pressure and save his comrades. Unfortunately, Hank's appearance attracts the Sentinels, and the two giants are soon immersed in a terrifying battle among the skyscrapers. Thanks to Giant Man's move, the rest of the group is able to make it to a secret entrance to the Wakandan consulate. Quicksilver punches in the code, Monica. On the other side stands a group of armed Wakandan soldiers headed by Taku, ready to take on the intruders. However, T'Challa's appearance pacifies his fellow countrymen, and they let the Avengers in. Young Tony Stark is completely awed by the high-tech machinery in the Wakandan's possession. He finds his mind racing with the endless potential that he now has at his disposal. He shows Black Panther designs for the Psy armor obtained from the Xavier Protocol. The young scientist is especially concerned about the power required to run the thing as Onslaught's EMP can render most electronics useless. However, Black Panther has a solution. With a smile, he opens a metal vault revealing mounds of the mythical metal vibranium. Above ground, Hank Pym manages to defeat one of the giant robots, but the resultant explosion knocks the giant superhero down. Losing consciousness, he goes back to his normal size and is soon surrounded by several gigantic robots. Just as a massive boot is about to crush Pym, Quicksilver rushes to his comrade's side and carries Hank away in a blur. Meanwhile, the Sentinels prepare to hunt the fleeing heroes down. Inside T'Challa's lab, Tony has been able to prepare several Psy helmets powered by Wakanda's greatest resource, Vibranium. He's also certain that with a small amount of Vibranium, Reed Richards would be able to duplicate these prototypes for the other heroes. Suddenly, the roof of the consulate crashes in and the gigantic head of a sentinel peers inside. Stark uses his repulsor beams to blast a hole through the robot's torso, terminating it. Stark guesses that this particular sentinel had been programmed to zero in on the consulate despite Quicksilver's diversion. Stark destroys the robot while the panther returns to his homeland. Looking upon his comrade, the monarch declares, You shall know the eternal gratitude of the Black Panther, Avenger. Wakandans will someday sing of this Iron Man. Having evaded the sentinels, Pietro and Hank are waiting for the Iron Man. Out of nowhere, a sentinel begins approaching them but falls apart before making it to them. It turns out to be a joke by the young Stark, who now hovers overhead with psi shields powerful enough to defend the heroes from onslaught. End of the line. The train on the number three line has been trapped under the city for about three hours. The train's occupants grow more frantic by the second as darkness engulfs them and oxygen gradually runs out. Fortunately, the Avengers, well, that is, Captain America, Thor, Wasp, and Scarlet Witch make it to the trapped subway. Using his powers, Thor, the God of Thunder, is able to make machinery functional again. Using this maneuver, the heroes are able to drag the train to the surface. However, when the doors open, our heroes find themselves overwhelmed by the sheer number of desperate citizens trying to make it to safety. As the heroes use their combined abilities to rescue the stranded passengers, the captain realizes that his team is nowhere near the peak of his powers. The Avengers' numbers have dwindled as Vision, Crystal, and Hawkeye split off with the Hulk, while Giant Man, Iron Man, and Quicksilver focused on preparing Psy Shields for the upcoming battle. The uncontrollable hordes begin to overpower our heroes, surrounding them from all sides helplessly. They scream for help, but no one arrives. Captain America finds himself looking for the Black Widow, who is supposed to rendezvous with the team. The Widow makes it to the team, but is extremely rattled by the chaos and destruction. As the team tries to recover, we find that Wasp is especially perturbed by the captain's behavior. The Avengers leader seems to be uncharacteristically hopeless, as if the situation was getting to him. Wasp remarks that if Steve Rogers lost hope, it would be over for the heroes. At that very instant, Iron Man, Quicksilver, and Giant Man appear before the team with the Psy Shields, ready to be used. However, their relief is squashed by a sudden energy blast that hits Thor from behind. Holocaust and Post standing among the ruins, ready to launch their attack. Post switches on his cloaking device, which renders him completely invisible to the naked eye. The villainous duo announces that they're there to steal the powerful Psy Shields for Onslaught. The battle veins, and Quicksilver rushes off with devices. However, a blast from Holocaust sends him and the device flying. Wanda manages to grab it using her powers, but the Holocaust attacks the witch by hurling Iron Man at her. The battle rages on in full swing when Wasp notices that the captain is stuck to his spot, seemingly unable to move. Wasp's worst fears come true when the Avengers' beacon of hope claims, We can't 
beat them. However, in reality, the captain has far from given up. Picking an opportune moment, he flings his mighty shield at Post and Holocaust. Using his impeccable understanding of battle strategy, he lines up Holocaust and the invisible Post in front of each other. Unaware of Post's presence, Holocaust hits the invisible monster with a powerful blast originally directed at the captain. The captain turns to Wasp, saying, We didn't have the manpower. We had to trick them into beating themselves. What did you think I meant? Distracted by the Post's fall, the Holocaust succumbs to a strike by Thor's mighty hammer. Bit by bit, the heroes tear him down, and the monster falls before their might. The crowd of spectators around the heroes goes wild, inspired by the actions of their heroes. However, before the heroes can soak in their victory, Onslaught appears on the screens nearby and vows to extinguish every shred of hope in the world. However, an attack from the Captain's shield silences the monster, and the heroes rush off to mount their offensive. Even gods retreat. Night has fallen over the city in ruins, and for the moment, New York rests. Beside the waterfront, Thor is conversing with his friend, the Red Novel. Thor tells his friends of his attempts to invoke a berserker rage that could potentially increase his strength tenfold. However, for the moment, the secret to this power evades the Asgardian prince. Thor tells Norvell of his experiences on Earth, about how once he believed that he was a doctor called Donald Blake. However, one day, he awakened his powers to become the god of storms and thunder. He eventually figured out that his true father was Odin, the Allfather. We catch glimpses of his past, and the two share anecdotes from their exploits. Suddenly, Odin appears before the two in the form of a homeless man. Odin narrates how he had flung his great sword Raveneye into the Rainbow Bridge as he saw Ragnarok approaching. As he slept after that, the god found himself on Earth in the avatar of an outcast. As Odin walks away, the duo finds that frogs have surrounded them. Thor suggests that Onslaught's actions have alerted even the animals, and the slippery creatures are there to say their goodbyes. Suddenly, Thor notices another familiar face in his vicinity. It's Jane Foster, his lover. She has found Thor to join the war efforts, and the two begin to overcome their past differences. Jane apologizes for her behavior and tells Thor that she was just unable to comprehend the fact that Don Blake wasn't real. The couple's conversation is interrupted when Red Norvell finds an injured man and his daughter walking around the street. The man is heavily injured and requires immediate medical assistance. Fortunately, Thor calls upon his experience as Dr. Donald Blake and performs an emergency procedure on the wounded man. Once the man is safely on his way to the ER, the two gods resume their conversation about attaining the Berserker Rage. However, they're again interrupted by the goddess of death, Hell, appearing from the depths of the waterfront. She offers Thor an offer. She prophesizes that the god of thunder will die the next day and go into nullity, but if he were to accompany the goddess tonight, he would become her mate, the prince of the dead. As Hell disappears, Thor is left behind with an even more perplexing conundrum and a dark fate faces in the fire. The regenerating mutant Wolverine has finally made his way to New York City. The city, overrun by sentinels, is in a state of utter devastation. Wolverine turns his attention to a building that's rapidly going up in flames. The fire department is working incessantly to quell the flames, but their efforts seem to be failing. Looters are running amok in the streets, and people are still stuck in the stories above. A mother cries helplessly, calling out to her child, Sean. The woman's other son tells her that Sean went back to get Mr. Winky. Wolverine hears this exchange and senses that two people are trapped in the building. The firefighters tell Wolverine that they can't get the kid to jump as their resources are stretched too thin. Wolverine runs up a short ladder and manages to reach the window cell. He finds the kid cowering under his bed, a soft toy clutched tight in his hands. Wolverine takes his mask off to befriend the child. The kid introduces himself as Sean. Then, upon Logan's inquiry about the second person trapped in the building, the kid states that Mr. Winky is actually his teddy bear. Wolverine carries the kid through the flames, shielding the young child with his body. Outside, the kid's mother watches in horror as the top floor of the skyscraper goes up in an explosion. Inside the inferno, Wolverine can't seem to find his way through the smoke and debris. All exits are blocked by the scalding flames and clouds of dust. His skin catches fire as he tries to escape and his uniform begins to burn off. Out of nowhere, a mysterious figure appears before him. It's an old man holding a stick. Even more surprisingly, he seems to know his way around the burning complex. With his directions, Wolverine is able to escape the burning building with the child unscathed. Wolverine himself has sustained brutal burns during their escape, but his regenerative factor fixes him instantaneously. Perplexed by the mysterious figure, Wolverine asks the firefighters to wet him with their hoses. Then he rushes back into the burning building, but is stopped momentarily by Sean. The kid hands Wolverine his mask and reminds Logan, can't be a hero without your mask. Wolverine thanks Sean and enters the building in pursuit of his mysterious guide. Wolverine rushes through the burning building and finds the old man leading him up to the roof. However, the moment he gets up there, he's attacked ferociously. Despite facing a barrage of blows from the old man's stick, Wolverine is determined to save him from the fire, even if it means dragging him out of there unconscious. The two battle on the roof of the flaming building, and the older man turns out to be an expert combatant. He knocks Wolverine again and again with his simple stick. Finally, Wolverine realizes who he's facing. 
You're a stick, the mutant murmurs. This only leads to further confusion as Wolverine knows that Elektra and Daredevil's former master is dead. The old man retorts, I don't let a little thing like death keep me down. As the battle progresses, Wolverine adapts to Stick's moves and begins evading the old mentor's attacks. Moreover, he realizes that Stick is neither dead nor alive. Instead, he seems to be existing on another plane entirely. Wolverine realizes that the great teacher is the only one who can make him a man again. He asks the revered mentor to teach him the values that were so ingrained in Electra. The sensei reluctantly agrees and tells Wolverine that he himself has the power to get back to being a man. In the midst of the raging flames, the old master lectures Logan, When Magneto took the metal out of you, you were the one who gave up on keeping yourself together. You ain't no animal, Logan, as long as he follows hard. Stick points as his stick into the smoke and tells Wolverine that as long as he jumps where the master points, the mutant will survive. With a great leap, Logan crosses over to safety and is greeted by the human touch. It turns out that the heroes have been trying to find Wolverine all this time, as his strength is required for the attack against Onslaught. An unlikely ally. Somewhere in the Balkans, the Fantastic Four's greatest enemy, Dr. Doom, is surveying the situation in New York City. On a screen in front of him, the last image is transferred by his satellites before Onslaught's EMP cut off all communication. Doom's minion continues to show him other visuals from the attack, and we stop on an image of the psionic entity itself. The brilliant scientist is fascinated by the monster's power and states that it even surpasses that of Magneto. Doom's interest in Onslaught is piqued even further when he discovers that Reed and Sue's son are also in the clutches of the monster. This would undoubtedly call for the Doctor's undivided attention. Back at the Four Freedoms Plaza, Sue Richards is trying to keep the war efforts going despite her personal grief. The complex is filled with heroes of all kinds trying to recover from their last battle with Onslaught. The Beast is working tirelessly to treat all the heroes, but the sheer numbers overwhelm him. She turns to find that Scott Lang has come back to his senses. The invisible woman comforts her friend and assures a desperate Scott that his daughter Cassie is safe. While Sue tends to the wounded, her husband Reed is working hard on the development of a neuromantic disruptor, a device that could render the monster's psionic powers useless. However, Reed's father, Nathaniel, warns them against confronting Onslaught. As a time traveler, Nathaniel is well familiar with the future and tells the family that many of them and their allies would be obliterated in the war with Onslaught. While the Fantastic Four discuss the future of their family, Franklin Richards, the youngest member, is locked away in Onslaught's Citadel. All alone in the heart of Onslaught, Franklin thinks about a trick he'd recently seen the villain perform. During the capture of the X-Man, Onslaught had used his psionic abilities to project images. Franklin begins meditating in an attempt to use a similar technique to contact his family. However, this desperate measure doesn't go unnoticed. High atop his citadel, Onslaught decides that he'll allow the images to reach the child's family, but not in the manner they intended. In the midst of constant battle, our heroes have finally found a quiet moment. Hawkeye and Iceman stand guard on the roof while others rest up. After days of struggle, Sue and Reed use this time to lament their child in a quiet embrace. Meanwhile, the Human Torch and the Thing have also returned to their respective partners. In another corner of the HQ, Scott Lang's daughter is growing more impatient by the second. Cassie is accompanied by Christoph Bernard, a man who's been artificially implanted with Doctor Doom's memory and knowledge. Suddenly, Cassie and Kristoff are attacked by Kang the Conqueror. Kristoff leaps at the villain while Cassie takes cover. At the moment Kristoff reaches his target, Kang vanishes. For the moment, it seems to have been just a mirage. The Thing and his lover, Alicia Masters, are spending a quiet moment when they're abruptly interrupted by the Psycho Man and his creation, a gigantic golem. Similarly, the Human Torch and his ex-wife, Lyja, are ambushed by the Super Scroll and Pybuck. A fierce battle ensues between the two parties. Lyja finds herself on the receiving end of a freezing attack from Pybuck, but at the very last moment, she's rescued by the Inhumans, Karnak and Gorgon. At the same moment, the Human Torch is fighting against the Super Skrull. The villainous alien can take any hero's form and seems to be giving Johnny a hard time. However, the leader of the Immortals, Black Bolt, appears before him and it seems like the cavalry has finally arrived. The entirety of the Fantastic Four's HQ seems to be filled with villains. Reed uses his elastic powers to take down the wingless wizard, while Sue uses her powers to defeat the Thinker. However, the moment our heroes hit their foes, the villain disappears. Reed deduces that Onslaught is using Franklin's reality warping power to give substance to frightening images in their son's mind. Even before he can finish the sentence, the couple is ambushed by Devos, the Devastator. However, a single blow from Namor quickly finishes the villain. Despite their past differences, Reed and Namor are forced to reconcile in this hour of need. Meanwhile, Black Panther and the Fantastic Four have also arrived in the building to take on the various villains. Even Angela Harkness has joined forces with the Fantastic Four as the world faces this unprecedented level of threat. Outside the HQ, an even greater enemy approaches the Fantastic Four. In the midst of battle, Johnny finds himself caught between Annihilus and the Dragon Man, but is saved by the team's mortal enemy, Doctor Doom. 
The dictator demands an urgent audience with Reed. Inside Reed Richards' lab, the Thing and She-Hulk are fighting off villains while the greatest scientist in the world works his magic. Using the skills at his disposal, Mr. Fantastic frantically rushes to complete the Neuromantic Disruptor. However, he lacks an energy source powerful enough to sustain the device. In an act of tremendous selflessness, the Thing offers Reed the only machine capable of transforming the hero back into his human form. Lifting the alien gizmo over his head, the Thing grunts at Reed, in case you forgot, Franklin's still my godchild, and there ain't nothing I wouldn't give up for him. Together, the team manages to get the machine working, and this vanquishes all the images invading the HQ. Angela Harkness states that her powers have allowed her to sense Franklin's presence through the images. The child is still alive. Relief rushes over Franklin's family and the other heroes, but this is no time to rest. Immediately, the heroes are faced with another choice. With Doom's arrival, the heroes stand unconvinced on whether to accept his assistance. However, Sue persuades the others to let the villain stay and join their cause. As all the heroes gather around Reed, he tells them to listen up. If we fail, humanity dies, he declares with a burning conviction in his eyes. Twilight of the Gods Joseph is locked in battle with a sentinel among the ruins of New York City. The former villain is disturbed by his own identity and is burdened by the crimes he once committed under the garb of Magneto. One of his giant foes is about to blast Joseph away when Rogue uses her incredible strength to blast through the robot. Even then, the duo is overpowered by the mutant killers and is facing certain defeat when a jarring explosion saves them from the fate. The voice emanating from inside the explosion is familiar and authoritative. Rogue identifies the man standing before them as Doctor Doom. The leader of the Avengers, X-Men explains that in a crisis so tremendous, it'd be stupid to refuse use Doom's help. The captain also tries to comfort Joseph and assures him that he wasn't the same man as before. Inside his citadel, Onslaught revels in his triumph. The last component to his devious master plan, Nate Gray, by squirming at the monster's feet. Onslaught towers over X-Man and tells him that after today, the homo superior race will achieve their rightful sovereignty. Moreover, Nate and young Franklin would be the avatars of humanity's annihilation. The Battle of New York rages on. The de-aged Magneto turns to find his old foe, Professor X, behind him. The revered founder of X-Men confesses to his old friend that it was his own pride that led them there. He regrets the actions performed during the Battle of Avalon. The professor states that he'd made the mistake of controlling and manipulating Magneto's power. However, it was Magneto's power that had ended up controlling the professor. In return, Magneto asked the professor what kind of monster he really was. You were a man of great strength and great weakness. You wished to protect mutants from those who would prey upon them. It was a noble dream, but you succumbed to your anger, Professor Xavier answers. Together, the two old comrades decide that it's time for them to play their own part in the conflict. While the Professor and Magneto plan their move, the other heroes also discuss their battle strategy. The team huddles in front of a screen, trying to figure out the best way to confront their foe, when Jean realizes that the Professor has left the team. Professor X has started making his way toward the dark citadel of their nemesis, Onslaught. The Professor's departure worries the X-Men, but Jean and Cyclops decide to keep the information from the other heroes. Jean sends out a telepathic signal to the other X-Men. Back at the citadel, Onslaught has just finished absorbing Nate's power. The X-Man tumbles into the monster's core to join Franklin Richards. However, the monster suddenly senses something. It's Professor X making his way toward the Citadel. The monster descends upon the mutant leader, and despite the Professor's attempts to reason with the psionic entity, Onslaught blasts Xavier with a massive blast. He towers over Xavier's helpless body and declares, Human or mutant, no one will survive the Onslaught. Final Battle The Watcher looks upon the grand battle unfolding on the surface of the Earth. He's there to chronicle humanity's grand ascension and to record the glory of its greatest heroes. We turn to the Big Apple and find the city completely devastated in the aftermath of Onslaught's attacks. The Watcher tells us that this is the story of how the Age of Heroes came to an end. Onslaught the psionic monster is now in possession of more power than he ever had before. Deep in his core, He's holding the X-Man and Franklin Richards hostage, just like he once did to the Professor. Xavier and Onslaught confront each other, but we know that the Professor lost his powers during his split with Onslaught. Just when it seemed like the end of the road for the Professor, a massive blast hits Onslaught squarely in the chest. The villain turns to find that the X-Men have descended upon him. Wolverine, Cyclops, Magneto, Cable, Gambit, Bishop, Storm, Jean, and Rogue all assemble in their teacher's defense. Onslaught tears through the earth under our hero's feet, and a terrible war begins. Despite their combined efforts, the X-Men find themselves underpowered in the battle with the Psy Beast. The X-Men's spirits are strong, but their flesh is made weak by Onslaught's previous attacks. With a blinding bolt of psychic energy, Onslaught dispatches the heroes, and they fall to the ground. Silence fills the air, and Xavier knows this might be the end for the children of the Atom. Yet, 
At that very moment, the dust settles, and help arrives. All of Marvel's heroes band together and stand beside the X-Men. The battlefield is filled with Avengers, Fantastic Four, and other superhero teams of all kinds, definitely obstructing Onslaught's path. They help the mutants to regain their footing, and soon, the heroes have formed their last line of defense. Anchored by this camaraderie, Onslaught fires off another attack. Fortunately, the heroes are able to evade and find cover. Xavier himself sheltered against Rock in the company of Joseph, and the two begin to hatch a plan that can stop Onslaught. Inside the monster's core, Nate and Franklin are growing more desperate by the second as the battle unfolds. Nate compliments Frank's bravery. The young child reminds X-Men that together, the two of them can do anything. As potentially the most powerful mutants ever born, the duo should be able to escape their captors' confines. Out on the battlefield, Cable uses his telepathic abilities to find the kids being held inside the monster. However, the Technovirus has weakened him greatly, and he's unable to generate enough psionic output to pull the hostages out by himself. This prompts Xavier to regret the loss of his psionic abilities, but Cable seems to have a plan. He says that he can probe into Joseph's brain and then use the magnetic force to break down the electrochemical barriers in the professor's brain. Xavier is forced to agree, despite the great risk, as he sees this as the only way to atone for his past sins. Tide changes. Nearby, Dr. Doom assesses Onslaught's powers and realizes that the monster is using most of his energy to hold up the barrier protecting him from the heroes. The evil genius uses his great intellect to find a clever loophole in the enemy's defenses and deduces that the barrier could be destroyed when Onslaught is distracted. He instructs Vision to use his density-changing ability and merge with Rogue. This maneuver greatly increases the mutant's strength, and she begins charging at Onslaught. Meanwhile, Wolverine and Namor use their powers to open a small rift in Onslaught's barrier, and this allows Rogue and Vision to strike a definitive blow. The strike is unable to even scratch the mutant's armor, but the heroes know that Doom's plan has worked. The psionic barrier around the monster has come down. However, as a consequence of their attack, both Rogue and Vision are grievously injured. Now that the monster's defenses are down, Hulk knows that he can take the villain down. But this would require a huge risk on his part. Hulk urges Jean Grey to enter his mind and shut off Banner. This would enable Hulk to unleash his true might, as he won't be burdened by Banner's control and humanity. Jean agrees and establishes a telepathic link with the rage monster. The Hulk screams out in excruciating pain as Bruce Banner is erased from his consciousness. Enraged, he screams, Hulk is the strongest there is. The Hulk begins to pound away at the Psy monster, each blow sounding like a massive explosion. While the giants engage in their fist fight, both Sue and Reed Richards have realized that this might as well be their final battle. For the first time in his life, the genius Mr. Fantastic doesn't really know what's about to unfold. Onslaught, buried under the weight of Hulk's blows, releases a psionic whirlwind powerful enough to blow the heroes back. However, the heroes combine their abilities and manage to stand their ground. The Hulk's blows ring out all across the Big Apple. Onslaught counters with his own attacks, but this only serves to further enrage the Hulk. Firing on all cylinders, the green rage monster screams, The madder the Hulk gets, the stronger the Hulk gets. The rage monster hits Onslaught with a blow that finally manages to break the tyrant's armor. An unholy sound, akin to a nuclear blast, fills the air, and the citizens of New York begin to panic. When the dust settles, we find that Banner and Hulk have been separated from each other and now lie unconscious on the battlefield. For a moment, the heroes start believing that the battle is won. However, a vast cyclone of pure energy begins to gather above our heroes, and from it emanates the villain's familiar voice. Onslaught claims that he's finally attained his final form and that physical attacks can no longer harm him. I am thought itself. I am perception. Perception is reality, and reality rejects you. Onslaught sneers. Down on the ground, Reed Richards realizes that the superheroes have been played for fools, and that Onslaught now has the upper hand, as he can no longer be touched. Thor suggests that if the heroes require a physical vessel to defeat Onslaught, he'd gladly sacrifice himself. The Prince of Asgard flies into the energy field, and his agonized screams fill the air. Reed says that Thor alone would be unable to contain Onslaught's power, and thus, Thing and the Human Torch follow the God of the Thunder into the energy field. Despite Sue's protests, the heroes offer themselves to the monster and march into the unknown. Onslaught feels himself weakening. What are you miserable parasites doing? You're draining me. More heroes like Giant Man, Wasp, Captain America, Black Panther, Falcon, Vision, Namor, and Scarlet Witch also walk into the mysterious energy cloud. Just then, Iron Man and Reed realize that Doctor Doom is nowhere to be found. Inside Onslaught's core, Nate and Franklin sense a familiar presence. After having his powers reignited by Cable, Professor X is able to sneak himself and Magneto into the monster's psyche. They urge Nate and Franklin to take their hands, but X-Man is unconvinced. You became everything the people feared, a mutant out of control, he screams at Xavier. However, 
The kind professor is able to convince the scared young man that there's indeed a place that will accept him, as he is, the Xavius Institute for Gifted Youngsters. But to get to it, Nate would have to trust the professor. Outside, more heroes continue to sacrifice themselves to the energy field in order to stop Onslaught. Reed stops mutants from going in, as he expects that mutant genetic patterns would help the monster grow stronger. This causes a separation between the mutant Quicksilver and his wife Crystal, as Crystal, an inhuman, dives straight into the field. A little distance away, Doom believes that his plan has come to fruition. With the help of the absorption module, Dr. Doom would be able to take in all of Onslaught's energy with ease. But before he can proceed any further, the absorption module is destroyed by an arrow fired by Hawkeye. Doom turns to find the other Avengers attacking him, and Iron Man carries the villain into the energy rift. They're followed by Sue and Reed, hand in hand, walking straight into the beyond. Reed tells the X-Men to attack the cloud with all their might. In the end, only the X-Men are left behind, and they hit Onslaught with the cumulative might of all their powers. A devastating explosion engulfs New York, and the cloud begins to recede. Space and time stand frozen, and reality itself is warped. From the other side, Nate, Franklin, Magneto, and Professor X fall out. However, before the field closes, Bruce Banner manages to drag his emaciated body to the other side. In the wake of the disaster, Franklin Richards finds that he's now alone. His entire family has sacrificed themselves for humanity's sake. Professor X comforts the child and reminds him that his parents will always be in his heart. Nate watches in awe and confesses that if they had heroes like the Fantastic Four and Avengers in his timeline, the world would have been a better place. With this, the Watcher ends his story, and while Apocalypse reminds Uwatu that with the heroes gone, the Age of Apocalypse would soon be upon them. Cable's Gift In the aftermath of the battle with Onslaught, we find Cable in a terrible state. The mutant is losing his ability to contain the Technovirus, and it started to take over his body. Friends like Cannonball, Caliban, and Domino surround him. Nathaniel Richards is standing beside them with his grandson, but the inventor is completely perplexed by the futuristic virus infecting Cable. Suddenly, Cable lashes out under the influence of the virus and knocks Caliban out of the window. The Morlock is saved by Cannonball, but it's clear that Cable is gradually losing himself. In his agony, Cable utters the name of his adopted son, Tyler. Lost in an alternate realm, Cable finds himself lost within his memories and arrives at the hillside beside the Guthrie farm in Kentucky. There, he encounters the deceased Tyler. The two proceed to have a heartfelt conversation, during which Tyler convinces Cable that his death wasn't Cable's fault. Overlooking the lush green landscape, the two seem to find some semblance of peace, and Cable moves on to his next destination. Outside, Nathaniel's efforts to save Cable aren't going so well. Metal pierces through Cable's body as the virus reaches his cerebral cortex. The entire lab is pushed by a sudden telekinetic jolt as the mutant begins to lose control of his power. Cable's dying! A desperate storm screams out to her teammates. Franklin tears up as his grandfather announces that Cable just has minutes left. In the realm of memories, Cable is now inside the forest of Ebenshire. This place is from Cable's own far-flung future, and Nathan finds Alia among its trees. This is his one true love, a woman who would marry him and then die soon after. She calls out to our weary traveler. The apparition convinces Cable that he must go back to the long path that's still ahead of him. She reminds him that, as the Ascani's son, it was Cable's destiny to keep fighting the good fight. Tyler and Alia bid Cable farewell and march off into the light while reigniting Nathan's purpose. Out in the real world, a miracle appears. Cable gains back control of his telekinesis, and the virus recedes back into his body. Having recovered completely, Nathan believes that his newfound power is the result of his heart being opened up again. The X-Men regroup. A steady downpour covers the ruins of the X-Men's fallen mansion. Professor X and Wolverine are sitting quietly, getting drenched in the rain together. Xavier isn't really in the best of moods. He's obsessed with his recent failures and is unable to overcome the guilt. Wolverine reminds the brooding professor that he wouldn't have lashed out if Magneto hadn't ripped the adamantium from Logan's skeleton. Charles asks Logan not to compare his experience with that of Xavier's. Having a beast inside oneself seems mundane when compared to the ability to manipulate people's minds. However, Wolverine doesn't take the bait and reiterates that Charles shouldn't be defining his entire life based on one mistake. In Central Park, the mysterious government agent Bastion surveys the battleground. He considers himself to be humanity's last line of defense against mutants. He vows that through his initiative, Operation Zero Tolerance, the mutants will finally pay for their sins. Meanwhile, Raiden Creed is campaigning for his election in the ruins of New York, claiming that the entire ordeal was the mutants' fault. They've taken our heroes. How much more can we give? All I need is one vote. Your vote. Amongst the journalists at the scene is Peter Parker, and the spider finds himself disgusted by the politician's opportunistic behavior. In Westchester, Scott Summers pulverizes his alarm clock with a small optic blast. Cyclops is just putting on his ruby quartz glasses when a dangling beast catches him off guard. In a reflex action, Summers shoots the beast down. Hank is pissed that for weeks a deviant doppelganger had lived amongst them. 
yet it was he who suffered Scott's attack. The two laugh it off and move to join the others around the kitchen table. Soon, they're among their friends. Jean cooks eggs while Pietro whizzes around the table and places all the cutlery. It almost feels like things are returning back to normal. However, Logan is still unable to convince Charles to let his failures go. Charles reminds Logan that 30 people have had to sacrifice themselves for his mistake. The city of New York has been completely crippled. Logan pleads with his mentor, Let us in. Let us help. Logan tells Charles that he was the reason Wolverine had stayed with the X-Men. Logan decides to leave the professor lost in his thoughts and walks off into the cold, damp morning to join the rest of his friends. Hey, I tried, he tells the others while sitting down at the breakfast table. The Professor's Atonement We find the Professor alone inside Cerebro. The machine informs Xavier that Professor X no longer exists. Charles then commands the machine to delete all the files pertaining to him. As he leaves the room, he comes upon a fallen picture of the first X-Men team, and this makes him reminisce. Abruptly, the doorbell rings throughout the mansion. Cyclops answers the door to find an unexpected guest. It's Valerie Cooper, chairwoman of the Committee on Mutant Affairs. Cyclops asks her whether the agency has been able to locate his brother, Havoc, but Dr. Cooper denies it. As she marches into the mansion, she tells the mutants around her that she's come to take Charles Xavier away. Enraged at this threat to their mentor, the X-Men stand in Valerie's way and state plainly that the Professor will not be taken anywhere against his consent. Cyclops tries to resolve the situation and asks the X-Men to stand down, but he too is adamantly against Xavier's arrest. Cooper, however, is undeterred and tells the mutants that after Onslaught's attack, it had become essential to take Xavier into their protective custody. Suddenly, Storm appears and surprisingly sides with Cooper. She acknowledges that despite the great pain, they would have to let Xavier go as they had no means to control him in case of another mental breakdown. This causes a split between the X-Men, and they begin discussing their predicament. At that very instant, Magneto climbs down the stairs. The Cooper is intrigued by why the X-Men are harboring their mortal enemy. The tensions begin escalating when Wolverine menacingly stands against Cooper's decision. Suddenly, a voice approaches the team. It's Xavier, and he agrees to go with Cooper. The professor believes that his incarceration is the only way to actually ensure the safety of the world. In an act of ultimate sacrifice, the professor entrusts the future to his students and leaves peacefully with Dr. Cooper. Aftermath. This is where the saga of Onslaught ends. The villain's actions have left the Marvel Universe in disarray. It appears that most of the world's heroes have died, while mutant kind is now hated more than ever before. This anti-mutant sentiment has been a great help to Bastion, who has found unprecedented support for Operation Zero Tolerance. Moreover, after Xavier's surrender, he was locked away in Bastion's base in New Mexico. This has granted the villain unfettered access to the powerful telepath as well as his secrets. But unknown to the heroes left on Earth, their allies are not really dead. We eventually find out that the heroes were saved by Franklin Richards' reality warping ability. The child had subconsciously used his powers to transport the heroes to a pocket dimension where they were all reborn into new lives. But that is a story for another time. The sheer scale of the Onslaught conflict was entirely unprecedented in the Marvel Universe at the time. However, the appeal of this saga lies not in its magnitude, but instead in the tiny nuances between its characters. This story dives deep into the profound questions from the very first page and continues to raise exciting ideas on diverse topics throughout its course. Needless to say, it provides us with some much-needed insight into our favorite characters and even offers lasting upgrades for others. Onslaught is a timeless epic that showcases everything we love about Marvel's heroes and prepares the audiences for more complex iterations of the characters that would arrive in the next decade. However, as we all know, nothing truly dies in the comics and Onslaught has made numerous cameo appearances in different storylines over the years. Well, that's all for this video, but do tell us what stories you'd want us to cover in the future by leaving a comment below.